Doctor Rubén. If we could uh, mute our phone, we we all mute our phone? Yeah, thanks so much for that, Dr. Roland. <laughs> yeah, um, good afternoon, everybody, again. Good afternoon, Botswana. Thank you so much for uh, being on the call and being on the call on time. Um, you're actually the fourth country on, on the virtual uh, you know, review calls. And um, you know, this is such an exciting time to be um, engaging with you. Um, like I've been mentioning over and over as we are you know, running this process, that uh, the Africa funding uh, tour is actually a pioneer, the first of its kind in Africa, you know, uh, bringing in uh, investors into a tour, you know, through six African countries, meeting with entrepreneurs uh, and project owners, you know, a very, very exciting season and time for all of us. So I just want to thank you for making the time to be on this call for the process that you've engaged with so far. Um, it's great. I just want to, uh, begin today's call and today's uh, virtual review uh, meeting with some introductions so that we know who's on the call. Um, my name is Nyakan Jun, I'm the CEO for Timeless Women of Wanda, I'm also the CEO for Timeless Dynamic Services, um, together with uh, Dr. Roland Roberts, who's the CEO of Courageous, an advisor to national uh, uh, governments, and also an enterprise and, and entrepreneurship expert will be leading the Africa funding tour uh, to bring solutions and, and opportunities for Africa to move into her destiny into a prosperous and strong thriving uh, continent economically and socially. Um, so I'd love to just um, say uh, good, good afternoon, good morning to you, Dr. Roland. Thank you for being on this call. Thank you, Nayakin, and good day to everyone uh, in Botswana. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. And I look forward to seeing you and meeting each of you in person in August. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, all of you have been engaged on the process that we've been uh, working on this far. And, uh, you know, uh, US project owners have been engaging with uh, some members of our projects teams, our technical review teams, just to support them in the process. And on this call, I'm joined by some members of our technical teams. And I'd love to introduce them um, on the call. Um, we have a visiting um, uh, uh, leader um, on the technical team, uh, Dr. Roland and others. His name is uh, Mr. Steve Ligalia. Uh, Mr. Steve Ligalia is the CEO uh, for FGB Solutions. He's a seasoned uh, financial consultant with PwC and other globally recognized financial institutions. He's also the former chairman of ISPAC Kenya and current chair of very many boards across various sectors. Uh, as part of the technical teams working on the submissions for all the six countries, he is the lead of the appraisal committee that's working on the submissions that are coming from all the six countries. So as we listen to your projects uh, today, he, is, he will be offering uh, as part of the review process, insights and recommendations uh, together with Michelle on how to strengthen uh, your, your submissions further. Uh, good afternoon, Steve, and welcome on the call. Maybe you can say hello, Steve. Mr. Lugalia, are you on the call? He is. We need to... there we go. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello, Steve. Welcome. I, I'd, forgotten to, I'd forgotten to unmute my mic. So <laughs> thank you, Jacqueline. Good afternoon, all of you. Um, and actually, I'm very, very excited to be engaging in this conversation today. And I, I look forward to hearing Thanks. much more about your appraisals, I mean, about your, your, your investment ideas. I think it's great to have uh, uh, this, these young people getting into, into these wonderful projects. So I wish you all uh, the best. And uh, as, as we listen to your, to your ideas, hopefully we can, we can, you can give some pointers uh, in terms of how you can improve them. Because as you know, when you're, when you're, when you're making a pitch, you must make it very, very attractive to, to the potential suitors. So we look forward to engaging with you. And I wish all of you uh, luck in terms of uh, uh, the, the proposals you put forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lugalia. And thank you for taking the time to be on this call. I appreciate your time. Yes. Um, next, I'd love to invite um, uh, Ms. Michelle Mwaka. Uh, Michelle is actually representing Cecilia uh, on this call, um, and, and she's, she's actually one of our lead uh, appraisers and analysts um, who's been working on, on the project. Uh, Michelle, um, please go ahead and say hello. Hi, everyone. This is Adam Michelle, and I'm glad to be representing the technical team. We have had a really awesome time reviewing the executive summaries. Everyone has been able to just bring out a different idea, you know, a unique idea, and that, that was really great. And we shall interact more about them as the call goes. Yeah, All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, the team that Michelle and Steve are working with are a team of, you know, legal experts, business advisory um, uh, support, uh, you know, uh, experts, you know, um, appraisers, and, and people who are very well equipped to, to support this process all the way to the end. Thank you, Michelle, for your remarks. Um, I'd love to um, invite Molly Moniki, who's actually our regional um, program lead at Timeless and has work, been working very, very closely behind the scenes with all of these entrepreneurs, the country leads and the project teams, just acting as a liaison for everything that needs to happen in the background. M Molly, um, welcome. In, in, in Africa, we say Karibu, which means welcome. Yeah, so Karibu, Molly. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Molly and I'm here to support everyone, especially in Botswana and I'm looking forward to hearing all the projects that have come on uh, for the funding tour and I'm really excited about this. Thank you so much. I thank you. All right. And she said Asante, that means thank you. For, for you Botswanans, it's good to learn East African languages as well, right? Asante. Yeah, thanks Molly. So um, I also then would like to invite um, to say hello and give a few remarks. Our Timeless Women Network representative in Botswana, also the country lead um, for our project and our work in Botswana, working very closely with all these projects that we'll be hearing. I'd love to invite Ms. Stella Motswere to, to actually say hello. Stella, you can unmute, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, June, for having gathered us this far and worked with us this far. Congratulations to all the enterprises and entrepreneurs on board. And to you, Dr. Roland, good afternoon again. <laughs> Greetings. Yes. Good day. And to Michelle and Molly, thank you so much for having worked with us and good afternoon. I see Lisa. Lisa, welcome on board. Lisa is from South Africa. I'm Stella and the national rep for Times Women in Botswana and the country lead. I look forward to this afternoon. We are all ready for Dr. Rowland. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Stella, for that. Um, it's good to see how we are, we are cross-pollinating. I think I would just love to give a few minutes to um, Lizelle Morris, who's our Timeless Women Network representative for South Africa. I see she's joined the call. I think for good reason, you know, probably to, to get insights, uh, you know, in preparation for the South Africa tour. Lizelle, if you could say hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lizelle Maurice, and I'm based in East London in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. And it's wonderful to be with you all. Thank you, June. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Molly, Dr. Roland. We're looking forward to hearing more from you. There's great excitement um, in South Africa as well. So we're looking forward to our call on the 3rd of July. And we're looking forward to those executive summaries coming in. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And good luck to everyone who submitted executive summaries. Thank you, Lizelle, and, and, and a great welcome. Yeah, Chair General, um, I've got a small joke for you there. You know yes. how we always joke about you calling me June and 
Tunya Khan. Today it's not you, today it's the rest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I just realized my mistake, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I always joke about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so without much ado, I'd just love to give um, a bit of an overview of Botswana, you know, from, from my perspective, because one of the things that I keep highlighting is um, there's a, a number of countries that are not so loud at, at blowing their trumpets and, and getting the, themselves known out there on the global stage. When you look at Africa, a lot of the, the countries that are well known out there on the global stage are countries such as Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Kenya, South Africa, you know, Rwanda now is upcoming. You know, these are some of the strong economies and also, you know, very strongly positioned as economic hubs in the continent. But uh, Africa has 54 countries, you know, very vibrant countries with a lot of great potential, you know, a lot of untapped, you know, uh, gifting and, and, you know, natural resource, human, human, human resource, a lot of intellectual capacity, creativity and capacity and culture that that a lot of the you know people outside outside of africa do not know about and botswana you know is one of the traits that that i feel is is also hidden in in the continent you know uh, a small country on the southern part of africa that has a population of about 2.2 million people you know um, a relatively mid age to older age <laughs> economy you know with uh, we need more youth you know growing in there so you know um, an economy that's mostly driven by mid mid age a mid age population, you know, um, a lot of uh, uh, you know inputs to the the Botswana economy is driven by uh, the mining industry being one of the largest uh, producers of diamonds and uh, being one of the largest suppliers of diamonds in the world. You know, it's been having you know a very strong economy and a very strong GDP over the last you know fifty to hundred years. In fact you know, one of Africa's top economies, you know, for the last 50 years back, as, you know, one of those, uh, you know, countries has been Botswana. Um, interestingly, at this stage in their development cycle, um, because of the lowering demand of diamonds, you know, the, the, you know, the, the economy has fluctuated a little bit. They're now in sort of like the mid-range um, to, to, top, to top economies still um, in Africa. Lots of sectors that are, 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 are very, very, um, you know, untapped great opportunities for investing and getting returns. You know, um, a lot of growth in the services sector, you know, hospitality, accommodation, you know, the transport and telecoms really big there, um, and, and construction, you know, the mining is still also a very big area um, to look into in Botswana. And um, you'll be seeing some of this thing, this demonstrated in, in the submissions that we're seeing out of Botswana and in the interest areas uh, for, for uh, you know, our projects in Botswana. Um, we are looking at uh, really, really um, seeing how to, to bring interest and to bring linkages to these opportunities that, that are being presented from this, our Southern African countries, Botswana being one of them. And again, when, you know, I, I want to, that beyond looking for money and answers to, to financial issues, there's a bigger, bigger vision and a bigger picture that, that Dr. Roland and I, you know, leading this, this, this process of the funding tour and also um, being able to get stakeholders who are buying into that is looking at shifting the narrative of Africa and, and getting all those different players who want to be involved in Africa's growth story. And we're looking at Africa positioning itself as the last and the next frontier and, um, and providing those opportunities for the rest of the world to engage with, collaborate, as we drive you know, our socioeconomic transformation, as we're solving our problems and as we're creating wealth and creating jobs on the continent. So you know, that bigger picture is beyond you know, uh, black and white, you know, it's beyond you know, joining dots, the T's and the I's, it's beyond just you know, linear, linear perspective. It's, it's broader and, and there's many dimensions of, of what we're trying to do. And ultimately we want to do the best that we can to be able to position Africa and African enterprises to thrive and to be able to contribute productively and positively to Africa's economy and Africa's growth. So um, I would just love to, to hand over the, 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 the mic for a brief uh, moment to Dr. Roland, just to share some insights and then we can begin to, to, to hear out um, you know, our enterprises. 
um, the, the format of this call is um, the whole objective is for our teams to provide you know insights um, reviews to your your sub submissions at this stage to give you insights and recommendations on how you can strengthen your your projects further and uh, position yourselves for the best outcome during the funding to in august um, and with that it means that it's an interactive process we'd love to hear you who you are you know your sectors your businesses what you're looking at what you're looking for um, some of your expectations and we'll hear back from our technical teams, you know, Steve, uh, Michelle, and, and also insights from Dr. Roland, who's actually on this call representing our network of American investors who will be on the tour and who he himself, you know, being an investor and being an enterprise expert, giving insights on what you need to be looking at and how you need to strengthen your submissions. So Dr. Roland, over to you um, just to share some insights uh, before we kick off the process. Thank you. Certainly, thank you, Nike. And uh, you know, we're we're so thrilled because what we're doing is just unprecedented as it relates to bringing American investors directly to African enterprise. Usually, uh, investor dollars were were more institutional and came through a bunch of other entities, and only you know a small amount ever made it to uh, to an Afri actual African entrepreneur. And so this process really takes not just institutional investors in the United States, but real just people uh, that have resources that like to invest in companies that traditionally have invested in maybe uh, uh, American companies or South American or you know European or maybe some Asia, and introducing them to the African businesses and saying, look, th the African business owner and entrepreneur uh, is quickly becoming. Uh, of the same caliber as rest of the world, they can compete as well. Uh, they know how to think uh, uh, with business metrics and manage their business accordingly, and they can be trusted. Um, and so and the, anytime you connect people who are not familiar with one another, trust is always a major issue. It's, a, it's a, a, an issue for the investors because they, you know, what if, uh, you know, they take our money and run? Well, and then of course you're saying, well, what if, uh, what if uh, we take we take your investment and you know it's uh, too much uh, burden for the business and it, it it's uh, undue hardship or something goes wrong um, and so there's there's just a trust issue that we uh, uh, Nike and I and of course with our relationship uh, have been able to bridge that divide and that gap which opens up uh, immense amounts of funding to African enterprises uh, but at the same time. Uh, we want the investors who evaluate deals on a daily basis, some of the, they, they're evaluating the best deals in the world and they're still not funding. Sometimes they, they still don't get, everyone doesn't get funded, you know, in that scenario, uh, even in the United States, right? So we want to make sure, and the purpose of this advanced preparation is to encourage you to refine your process, your story, your ask, how much you're asking for funding, the purpose of those funds, because we want you to be very articulate in a very short period of time. You're not given 10 minutes to explain your business and how much you know about the industry and why they should invest in you in August. You'll get like two minutes. And then the investor will know if they want to ask further questions and what specific pieces of information they want to know. And the biggest, uh, there, there's several common themes that we have seen across the continent uh, that will uh, uh, hurt your chances uh, of getting funded. And so we want to uh, preempt those so that, so that uh, those are not an issue and those do not hold you back. Uh, and one of those is what you think is important to talk about may not be what the investor is waiting to hear. And so it's, they can, if Americans or uh, investors especially um, have short attention spans and they won't give the courtesy of just listening to you speak as long as you want to speak. They want to know, what do you do? What, uh, how much revenue are you making? What is your profit? Uh, and so your expenses uh, and your profit and how much money are you looking for? And then they will be able to, because in their minds, they are going to know if they're going to uh, offer debt financing, equity financing, revenue share. They're trying to determine based on your industry, based on where your company is at on that pendulum, uh, what would be the best source of funding for you? And so they're trying to find reasons to invest in you. They're trying to 
uh, find ways to invest. So you don't have to sell them. You just simply need to provide and follow the package that in process that Timeless through Nyakin and Michelle and others have put together. So I look forward to hearing, uh, hearing where we are and uh, moving along. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Dr. Rodan, absolutely. Um, and I really like that on this call, you represent a number of different things, you know. Um, you know, you, re you represent the mindsets of the American uh, investors, you know. Um, just as, uh, you know, we in the Timeless Network represent the mindsets of the African dynamic and context. So that's a great advantage to, to all the people on this call. But, but also presenting the investor, you know, the mindset and what investors will be looking at. So as you're engaging on this call, you know, um, have, you have the advantage of already sort of like pre-engaging with the investors in advance, you know, um, uh, you know, by having Dr. Roland and, and actually Steve. Steve also um, uh, goes through a lot of these processes, you know, before you, so that you can just have that initial like prep preparation, you know, sort of like practice on what that will feel like, look like, and the kind of questions that will be being asked and the things that you must prepare um, uh, for the call, you know. Um, so without uh, much ado, I'd just love us to introduce ourselves very briefly and very um, precisely and efficiently. Just tell us a little bit about, you know, your, your name, your, your organization, your project, what sector your project is in, and, and what are you looking for? What, 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 what kind of funding are you looking for? I will start in the order of my screen. And as we go through this process, um, Stella, as, as the lead for Botswana, please, feel free to give your insights, you know, some of your thoughts and recommendations help um, us to be able to manage this whole uh, Botswana review call in an efficient and productive manner for, for our enterprises in Botswana. Uh, feel just free to, to, to be fully engaged in the process, okay? Yeah, so in the order of my screen, we have um, Donald, we have McDonald. Hello everyone, how are you? Good day. Yes, my name is McDonald Nyabonda. Um, my business is called Valley Foods. It's a flour and maize milling processing plant. It's a fast uh, moving <clears throat> consumer goods. company. I'm on this platform. I'm looking for funding <clears throat> to set up the milling plant with a size of 60 ton processing of flour as an initial base. Uh, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the, the market survey has been done. Uh, we have a full business plan uh, to showcase uh, uh, what, what, what we entail. We are also looking for <clears throat> money to build uh, the storage facilities for, for the grains. Uh, we are also looking for money to put up uh, uh, the warehouse where, where, where the machinery will be housed. We are looking at employing uh, 60 people uh, on the initial stages uh, to, be, to be involved with the, the processing and, uh, and the packaging. And, uh, and uh, the, the delivery of, of, of the byproducts in the, in the first three years. In the second, uh, Two years, we are looking to build a base whereby we start agri-finance because we, 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 we are in Botswana and Botswana is, is semi-arid. So we'd want to, to take money from, from, from which we'll be raising through ourselves and, uh, and we'll plow it back uh, into the farmers in the region. We are targeting basically farmers in South Africa, farmers in Zambia. Uh, for us to have a uh, grain uh, 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 coming into Botswana, into our silos, to, to cover us uh, 
on the on the on, on the on the aridness of, of our country. Uh, <clears throat> finally, uh, we are also looking uh, through the partnership uh, to have strategic alliances in uh, countries like uh, uh, Germany, Turkey, uh, Kazakhstan for us to be bringing uh, raw materials, especially the wheat, uh, which we will then process. Furthermore, we are looking at uh, further processing of the raw materials. Uh, after we've produced the flour, we are looking at further processing, uh, that is within the, next, within the next five years, of processing the flour into cereals, of processing the flour, of, of processing the, the byproducts into cereals, into stock feed, into uh, uh, canned, canned foods. Uh, <clears throat> so right now I am on the platform, I'm looking for, for 25 million uh, puller, which is roughly about 2.5 million US dollars. In terms of revenue that is going to be raised in the first year, we are looking at about 12 million puller. In the second year, we are looking at about 20 million fuller. And in the third year, we are looking at 27 fuller. 27, sorry, 27 million fuller. Having said, having said that, uh, we hope we'll find a suitor uh, who will come on board and help us uh, in setting up the business. In terms of the marketing, we have, we have gone in, uh, we have uh, our research done with bakeries, in-store bakeries, and home-based bakeries, which is the informal sector. Uh, the big bakeries, we, we have been given um, uh, an agreement uh, that they are interested to do business with us uh, once we have started operating. The in-store bakeries, we are talking of uh, our shoppies, supermarkets, we are talking of our uh, Cephalana, we are talking of our spas, we are talking of our pick and pay. Uh, they are all uh, worried about the state of flour which are being produced by our competitors due to the, to the wheat uh, that they are using. Uh, and the quality of, of the bread is, is not that good. They've also uh, given us undertakings that once we, we are producing, they are, they are prepared to, to be taken from us, uh, our pro products. We, we did our cash, our cash flow projection based uh, not on 100% production, but if we are to do 100% production for the flour milling, we are looking at 60 tons, we are looking at a revenue of close to 10 million a month. Having said that, we are open for business, we are open uh, for, for debt equity, we are open for, for shareholding, we are open, we want to get this ball running as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, McDonald. I think you're very clear and, um, and you've given you know, quite a lot of information that could be needed. Thank you so much. Any insights, Dr. Roland? Any insights, Steve, on that one? I think Steve is still muted. Steve, kindly unmute. Okay. I, keep, I keep doing that, I don't know why. <laughs> so I saying, McDonald, I think you, you've uh, really thought through your project. I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed by the amount of detail uh, that you have. You've also done a market research, which is uh, it's a good thing to do. And, and also the area you are in, you know, if you look at uh, the recent happenings, like, for example, if I give you uh, the example of our country, yeah, the businesses that seems to have kind of survived, you find that actually the food industry. Yeah? Uh, a lot of other businesses were very much negatively affected by this COVID. So it, it's an area that you know, there's, there's quite a bit of potential. Uh, and I like what you've done. The, the only thing I, li I like to, to, to just highlight to you is, first of all, in terms of the competition. You, you talk about uh, the competition I've got uh, 
the feedback you're getting is that the competition has got, uh, the, 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 their product is not of good quality because of the which they're using. And therefore, what you want to do to get over that is to import good quality wheat. So you need to think about the, the implications and complexities of, of importation of wheat, the cost aspects of it, the reliability of those importations. Yeah? Is there potential to grow wheat in Botswana, for example? Just a thought. Yeah? Because I see in year two, you want to go into agribusiness. Yeah? So, so just expand your thinking around complexities of, 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 of importing raw materials. As you've seen what has happened recently, most, most businesses could not actually import anything. Yeah? They're stuck within their regions with what they have. So just give some thought to that. Um, and also in terms of competition, yeah. I mean, what are these competition doing about to improve their, their products? Yeah? At the moment, your choppies and other supermarkets and consumers are complaining about the quality. But what, what are they doing about it? And then the, the issue of agribusiness, agri, you talked about agri-finance. I wasn't quite sure. Um, I wasn't quite sure what the the model there is. Maybe maybe you can just spend a minute just to expound on the aspect of agri finance. Thank you very much. Uh, the the ag the agri finance is is coming on the backdrop of uh, of the climate condition of Botswana. Botswana uh, is, is an arid place. It uh, has got low, low rainfalls. It is very, very hot some, sometimes. And it is also very cold in winter because it's, it's arid. Because of that, you find that uh, most of its products uh, relating to food are being imported. Therefore, uh, for, for, for our viability, we felt that we also have to trap some farmers by doing contract farming, whereby we are going to foresee farmers in the region who will, who will, who will finance 100% for their crops and who will be taking the crop. But we make sure that it's a win win situation with the farmers uh, so that we safeguard the interest of our business. Because without the grain, we cannot do much. Without the wheat, we cannot do much. So we have to safeguard our interests in the region by providing a finance to farmers uh, to produce for us. Uh, uh, wheat to produce for us maize, to produce for us uh, soybeans, all the all the all the, the, the products that we want. So we'd tailor up a, a model which which I think it, at the end it should be looking like a finance bank, whereby we are buying these grains uh, on a contract level where we finance the farmer from day one until we get to the produce. The produce which we will then take into our milling plant because our intention is to start in Botswana, but we are also looking at replicating the same model of the milling plant in other uh, selected uh, countries within the region, within Southern Africa uh, for now. So basically we are saying if we are to be financed as we are building up the base, the capital, we need to, to protect our reserves and make sure that our silos are always having produce to run us for, for a couple of, 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 of years. That's basically the idea on the agri finance. I hope, I hope I'm clear. Very clear. Thank, thank you very much, McDonald. I think that, that makes it very clear. Uh, Nyakana, what you? Can I add to McDonald's uh, comments? Yeah, yes. Um, his product is in the agri-foods industry. And indeed, uh, Botswana is a country that is very dry, with very few selected areas for crop farming. And indeed, the government is encouraging that we produce our own and reduce a lot of imports 
because of the weather condition here, we are forced to import almost 95% of our food from outside, including simple food like fruits, apples, oranges, even vegetables. We are at the time where the government is really encouraging local production and looking into possible Arab land within the country where entrepreneurs and the locals can be allocated land or buy land to produce food locally. So McDonald's project comes at a time when the government is very much supportive even in terms of opening markets locally and linking them with other platforms that are local to sell their products. So I thought I should just add on that. It's going to be a common <coughs> comment across all agri-products executive summaries that have been presented. But thank you, McDonald, for the work that you have done so far to go even deeper into making agreements with the local wholesale industries and even the local community groups to supply your product. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. Um, next on my screen is Priska. Priska, would you, would you unmute your mic and uh, tell us about you know, your, your project, your name, what you're looking for in terms of funding, yeah? Let's try and make it as efficient as possible so that as many people as, as, as are on the call can be able to share, you know. Priska, unmute your mic, please. Hello. We can hear Hello? you. Yes, Priska. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Priska. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. Yes. Um, my company is uh, Health Partners. Health Partners is actually a mobile uh, health services. Uh, we've, been, we've been on uh, this game from 2001. Uh, basically what we, we, we service is uh, working with the uh, other private sector uh, to take uh, health services to where they are. Um, we've been limited uh, basically because of uh, lack of funds uh, to mostly be in the capital city, Gaboroni. Um, we have been uh, uh, looking at uh, a lot of other potential uh, areas uh, where the, this kind of services is, is required. Uh, like for instance, uh, when, when I look at the, the far up north, uh, where the, the, the tourist industry is located, um, I, I see health partners uh, working very well with um, all those hotels and uh, tourist tourist areas. Um, currently, there is a there is a, a, a big bridge that has just been uh, uh, opened, the Kazugula Bridge, uh, which connects uh, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, and and, and other. Uh, I think yeah, those three major countries. Um, and and uh, uh, there is a lot of potential for health partners also to partner with uh, um, uh, 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 other, even other countries in that area to provide uh, uh, health screening. Mainly, we do health screening. Uh, we, we do provide uh, uh, a treatment, but not uh, fully like uh, you are uh, in, in, the, in the clinic. We, we would uh, uh, give uh, basic uh, medicines and then, uh, of course, refer. Um, but uh, we, my limitation also has been, I, I have worked with uh, uh, other doctors uh, that were interested in the, in, the, in the health, but for the lack of uh, funding, uh, we, 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 then, we then, of course, uh, um, ran short of uh, paying uh, the, the, the doctors that were, were working with us. But uh, uh, basically, the, the, the health partnership is looking to expand. And uh, as I indicated on my brief, um, uh, I, I, I don't see 
myself uh, going beyond uh, maybe 1.5 million to get uh, maybe one or two other uh, um, vehicles uh, well equipped uh, to be able to move between the the, uh, um, the 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 areas of needs uh, that I have identified. I didn't do a fully fleshed uh, uh, study, uh, but uh, from from uh, talking to hotels owners and uh, other uh, um, uh, tourist places, uh, they 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 welcome the idea of uh, you know if you can bring these health services to us. Uh, that that would really be a, a wonderful thing. In the past, what we did was we 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 sign up contracts with a, a company. They engage us maybe for two to three years, and uh, we provide. We go there maybe once or two weeks, uh, once in a week. We provide all the uh, the services uh, that they cannot. Most most times, what we have most noticed is uh, uh, companies don't want to have their employees leave workplaces, go and queue in, in, in clinics or hospitals and uh, uh, disrupting their work uh, uh, places, I mean, their work, work schedules. So, so that's, that's the kind of services that we, 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 we have uh, gone into. Um, um, Priska, thank you for uh, sharing that overview. Uh, some specific questions. Yes. Uh, how much yes. revenue are you doing right now? Um, you know, because of the, uh, the, 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 the economy within, because once the companies are affected, then of course uh, it trickles down to services like ours. But uh, between the uh, 250 to 500, uh, you know, a month. So it's, um, we haven't really been uh, uh, doing that much money, I must say. But right. uh, I, I think mainly because of the limited services that we are providing also, because we are just situated in, in one area. Okay. And, and you said you're asking, you're seeking 1.5? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at 1.5, basically to, to get an additional, maybe two vehicles, because I didn't spend uh, uh, much on the, the, the first one. Um, uh, so, so I don't think uh, if I get, I had, I had bought a clinic that I had uh, well equipped, but not fully, fully fleshed. But uh, I didn't spend uh, more than half a million. So I'm looking at uh, if, if I was to get maybe 1.5, that would actually um, allow me to be able to get the necessary stuff and and uh, uh, equip maybe two more vehicles. What year did you start the business? Come again. <clears throat> okay, I, I believe... Uh, we can follow up, uh, you know, later on that particular question. We did get all the information we needed uh, from Priska. Thank you, Priska. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Priska. Um, next on my screen is Edda. Edda, are you ready? If you're ready, you can take the mic. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Edda. No, how are you? I just joined the meeting. I was not ready to represent. I just joined the meeting to listen, no not today. Okay, no Thank problem. You. That's fine. Thank you. Tembisile? Tembisile, are you from Botswana? Yes, I am from Botswana. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Tembisile. Yes, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for giving me um, this opportunity to present my, my project. Uh, my project, which I, I presented, it's uh, called McFin PTY LTD. Uh, it's a financial services um, a business uh, that um, uh, was doing uh, invoice um, discounting purchase order financing. Um, as well as um, 
account receivable uh, management and wage bill uh, financing. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the, the business is to help SMMEs to be able to, fund, to find uh, funding for the work that they have won, either from government, uh, parastatals, or private sector. Because um, we, I noted that um, there is a, a, a real big gap in terms of financing small medium enterprises, uh, not on the regular uh, financing uh, products which are offered by financial institutions, because you find that small medium enterprises know their game, they know what they are doing, but uh, in some cases they lack the, the to provide the required information uh, and also issues of uh, security. And therefore, this um, uh, uh, business is actually to bridge that gap to allow SMMEs to be financed based on the purchase order or the, the, the invoice or based on the relationship that um, uh, uh, we have with them in terms of uh, financing their wage bills should they be uh, having not been paid from um, uh, the, 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 the businesses that they have um, uh, uh, you know, supplied to. So basically what um, uh, I have done, uh, this business it's now registered with um, the non-bank financial uh, institution. And um, I also used to be, uh, I, I also set up in, a, in an, um, an issue where we're negotiating with the Botswana government to set up a, a session um, arrangement which is now uh, set up. But then because of lack of finance, I could not continue uh, with, the, with the business, but otherwise the business is all registered. And it's, um, you know, if I have the finance, I simply move back into the stream of financing because somewhere along the line, uh, I ran short of um, the, the, the finance. But what is actually happening in terms of the session arrangement with government, is that uh, if you are in the invoice discounting or purchase order financing, uh, you the government deducts directly from the, 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 the government's uh, uh, pay structure and pay the, 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 the factoring company uh, and the, the whole invoice amount. And then the matter remains between the supplier and the, 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 the factoring company to split the amount, therefore minimizing the risk of a loss. Because in some cases you found that you finance um, a, 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 a business and then they see another tender and they go for that tender and they take the money which they have been paid for, for that purchase order, for instance, and then they go and finance another uh, purchase, I mean, another tender that they have won. So in this arrangement, it actually minimizes um, the risk of loss while you are growing uh, you know, the, 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 the business uh, in terms of helping the SMME to grow. We also offer um, advice as to how these businesses can manage, uh, that's why there's the, 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 the financial management part, how they can manage their finances so that they don't run into situations whereby they have not been able to pay bills and they end up um, going into, into, more, into more debts. So what, what um, uh, I have done, I have looked at um, uh, basing on the previous experience that I had uh, running the business, but also knowing that um, there are currently about 51,000 or there about um, uh, SMMEs that uh, require um, uh, finance, uh, employing about 125,000 people. And of course, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, these, these figures are really now, uh, you know, just like um, a, a drop in the ocean because what has actually happened in the country because of the COVID-19 is that a number of people are now looking into going into uh, running their own businesses because of the fact that um, they have either, uh, you know, the companies that they work for are experiencing problems and also the government is also encouraging what they call um, trying to heave up some of the, the, the people who have been in, in government employment for some time. I actually set in that um, strategy where they want to encourage 
people who have been working for government for some time to come out and start their own businesses. And therefore this business would be, uh, McFin would be the right place because while they are still building their, 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 their account history with their financial institutions, uh, they can be able to get tenders, uh, whether from the private sector or from the government or indeed from the local authorities and they will be able to run uh, their businesses. Now, the research that I have done um, is that uh, the uh, financial institutions are also offering purchase order financing because they have noted that um, it is a low hanging fruit for them because they usually run into a lot of um, uh, you know, people not paying. But then um, the issue with financial institutions is that um, they, they, they are only looking at their own um, customers to offer a purchase order financing and invoice discounting. And yet um, with, with my business, I am not actually looking at the, 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 the person being my customer. I am building a relationship with that um, person who is having a purchase order financing that needs to be financed so that we can have a long-term relationship. But I'm not looking into them opening an account like um, the financial institutions are doing. So um, in terms of um, the amount that um, I am looking for, uh, for a start, I'm looking for uh, about a million and 25,000. Um, uh, now, the, 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 the reason why I am looking for this amount is because I believe that one of the efficient ways of running a purchase order financing and invoice discounting, it's more on, on, on a revolving finance um, aspect in the sense that um, as, you, as, you, as you finance uh, your small and medium enterprises, you then have to, you, 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 you cannot keep the, 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 the funds in, in a, a way which are not utilized. So that's why I am looking for that amount that um, it has to be on a revolving uh, credit um, uh, aspect. In terms of employment, uh, the employment that I'm looking at for, for a start, it's about uh, 13 employees. Uh, because of uh, technology, uh, there will be no need to set people or set uh, branches uh, in, 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 in strategic um, locations like uh, Francis Town, for instance, but then uh, it will be done on um, a technological base whereby customers can, I mean, SMEs can apply online. Uh, these 13 people will just be to make sure that um, we market the product and we also safeguard the turnaround times. And also the other critical aspect is that um, if uh, an SMME requires say goods from outside um, the country we also have to assist the SMME do the searches and make sure that where he is actually sourcing the goods is the right um, uh, place and uh, follow through with the, those goods until they are delivered uh, to the to the buyer so those are some of the things I would need to do uh, with the employees that um, I have. Because at times you find that the SMME, without knowing that um, is dealing with somebody who maybe the, 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 the products are not meeting the specifications, then there is an issue on the uh, uh, delivery where the buyer then uh, disputes the, the, the quality of the goods that have been bought. And therefore, it means the financing is now on a on a on a on a on a stage of um, a loss. So that's, those thank are you. yes, thank you. I, I, pardon me. Uh, a quick question here. Um, I really want to make sure we get to all of the businesses, and so uh, I want to specifically address uh, regarding the amount that you're seeking of uh, funding. Uh, yes. I would. You have a lot of things going on, uh, and so if you don't have I know you used to have revenue. It sounds like, and then you said you don't have revenue now, but with this funding, then you would move into the, uh, you know, into the invoice order financing, PO financing, and, and of course, uh, you still have the bookkeeping service and so forth. Um, what I would recommend, uh, any type of uh, factoring lending is, uh, cons obviously, it's considered a little, it's, it's a risky business. Uh, even though it's very profitable, it can be very, very profitable. 
So I, I think it's a good business that you have. You obviously know your business backwards and forwards. Uh, so can, so that's just uh, a great job on your part. Um, but I would recommend, because um, uh, in the United States, whenever people try to get funds to uh, that will serve as lending uh, or finance, um, even whether it's microfinance or especially in a case like this, uh, they typically like to have relationships with organizations that uh, provide factoring lending. And what that means is uh, if, if you put uh, $10,000 with a bank, then you're allowed to lend $100,000. Maybe it's a 10% factory lending uh, so that it's not $1 uh, that you give with the bank is how much you can lend. Uh, you, the only way to make a business like that really work long term and be sustainable is fact is is, is factoring uh, lending, where where you actually only have to have about twenty percent or thirty percent of the money of the total amount that you can lend, the lending power, or else the the economics rarely will work. So uh, I, I keep working on those numbers. Uh, just think through that. And the other thing is when you're talking to the investors in August. Be very specific. We're going to do this service, this service, this service. We used to do one of these services. We're not doing that now, but we believe that we will generate, uh, you know, X amount of revenue in the first year uh, if we receive this investment. But I think that will help. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your heart and your business. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Um, thank you for that um, uh, advice, um, Roland. Thank you. With pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Thambisile. Um, next, we have Leonard. Leonard, welcome again. Yeah. Your multi country project presenting, right? Welcome. Welcome. Leonard, could you unmute, please? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, um, my name is Leonard, uh, representing Lab Furniture and Equipment. Um, we're currently, this is the head office of uh, Lab Furniture and Equipment. This is in the manufacturing of laboratory furniture and equipment. And uh, this company uh, was officially independent in 2013, but after operating for more than 10 years within Botswana, within uh, the education and the health uh, institutes. So um, currently we are operating in Haboroni, a factory in Haboroni, which uh, has got an employment of employees and we are the ones who are responsible for furnishing the schools with laboratory furniture, which is of high uh, quality, which is 40 year warranty. We started this company after realizing that uh, what was being installed was uh, substandard kind of materials which were uh, requiring a recurrence maintain two years, two years, they needed to go and do maintenance for them. But then we uh, did our research and discovered that in Europe, they were using 40 year warranty and we went to learn the technology and we came and started a factory here and we implemented here in so currently in Botswana we have um, we are running projects where we are doing all the junior schools the, our capacity at present it allows us to do about eight to ten laboratories a month because of the kind of machinery that we have, but we are looking at that we need to have uh, to produce up to 20 laboratories in a month. We have got equipment and machinery that is required for us to, to, to increase the capacity to our, uh, our production so that we meet uh, the demand at present. The Botswana government is actually rolled out that it needs to install 100 laboratories for junior schools. And we currently, uh, um, they are at 50, which are being 
but they want to do all 400 to match the quality and the standard that we have presented. With the program that we did with the Botswana government, we discovered that so many other governments, they are in need of that. We were invited to Rwanda and we, we also made an agreement with the government after they realized the, the, the kind of product that we produce. We did the same with the Zimbabwean government, the factory in Zimbabwe, and we've done quite a number of projects there. But however, with my presentation today, I am coming in appealing for assistance or help in order to upgrade our, our factory here in Botswana so that we can be able to to handle the Zambian and other surrounding areas demands because uh, our machinery equipment is only allowing us to 10 instead of 20. And uh, so I've come up yesterday when I did my presentation, it is a, for a new factory, but for okay, so here don't... it is an upgrade my... of an existing factory. Oh, sorry. Hello. Sorry, I thought you was an interruption. It's a, a request for upgrading the existing factory with um, the in equipment and machine. All we are looking at also um, partnership, which would allow us to grow bigger than what we are today. So, um, all in all, both projects between here and Rwanda. My request was $1 million, uh, which is about 10,000 fuller. But Rwanda, uh, yesterday we had the 700,000, which was put in for the machinery and equipment for that new venture, leaving uh, $300,000 for Botswana venture. So at the moment, currently, uh, my request for upgrading Botswana is 300,000. Uh, to be able to meet the demand that we have at present. Uh, Leonard, thank you for that quick question. Uh, what does putting in 300 and upgrading the Botswana factory generate in terms of revenue, additional revenue compared to putting in 700,000 into a new factory uh, uh, in Rwanda? So I'm wondering if, if we have to choose one or the other, which will give a faster return for your business? Okay, the Botswana one, it's, it's a running project, but the Rwandan one, right, uh, to me, the government of Rwanda is the one which invited us to put in the Memorandum of Understanding, they've put in projects, which are amount to almost 40 million US dollars, which is within the next five, years. We have, they've asked us to quote, we gave them quotations for those and uh, it's something which it's starting with the moon. We've got projects to run. The Botswana one, it's, we are running a project which we are doing for the government currently and the pace doing it at, we are still not have reached where we wanted to be. So for one, uh, uh, it's for me, it is bigger than than what we have right now here, the Botswana one. Because Rwanda, they never had that. It's actually like you are going, you are going to a virgin land where you've got materials which they want, they want you to utilize what they have, the resources which they never utilized. And with that, it's for me, I would, if I was to choose, I would choose there. But I'm presenting that we would want both companies, both factories running at, um, at, at, at full capacity. Right. And both company, both locations are under the same company, right? I don't know if I have managed to answer the question. You did, yes. yes. But it is not at separate companies, right? It's all under the same company? It is the same company. Good. But, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great seeing you, you and, and what a great business. You've lined up the MOUs, the contracts, which I know Michelle will mention to everyone, uh, but you just have everything as it should be in order. Uh, and that makes uh, investors uh, very- Yes, we have got all that. Yes, on the one and 
fact, we have got the RDB. All these things are being run through RDB. Right? All the connections, wherever, all the areas that we've gone, it was through the leadership of RDB. Okay. All right. Everything so that's, yeah. No, I think you've got uh, you've got in through the right channels um, for sure, Leonard. I think um, you know the, the strength on on your pro proposals is very clear. Uh, well done. I think we'll move very quickly on to Lucy. Um, please try and make your 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 introduction very efficient and brief and precise based on the guidelines that that we have shared, so that as many of you can be able to introduce. Kindly, let's get as many of you to speak. So make it brief, precise, and you know, um, and, and and you know, bring out what it is that you want. Okay. Next, we have Lucy, please. Okay. If Lucy is still preparing, can we move to can we move to Buhere? Uh, Nyaka Buhere is one of the technical analysts. She's one of the analysts. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with her name. That name she's using. No worries. Yeah. So um, let's move on to Lucy. I see your, you've unmuted your mic. Can we move on to Ditlenyane? Ditlenyane. Is Chris ready? Chris? Okay. Um, Wilbert, is Wilbert ready? Yes, yes, Stella. I was about to say try Wilbert, but you are there, yes. Let's try Wilbert while they are still connecting. I think they have a problem with their volumes. How to connect to the volume. And maybe if someone uh, is ready, if they can just go ahead and start, that might be helpful right now. Good afternoon. Okay, hello. Vivian, hello. Yeah. Vivian, please go. Uh, good hello. afternoon. Hello. Hi, Vivian. Yes, I'm being joined by uh, Webster, who is also my partner. So you'll do the representing today. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Webster. We have a college called Kito International College. Uh, this college is uh, is uh, one of its kind in the in the in the country and possibly in the region. We we have a, um, a, um, a synergized way of uh, instruction delivery, and um, um, this this college was set up in 2017. It has been accredited with the Botswana Qualifications Authority. Um, it operates within the automotive technical sector as well as business uh, business side of things, but. Um, the way it operates, it has a sister company that operates within the automotive sector. And uh, because of a shortage of skilled uh, people within Botswana, most of the people in the op automotive sector are either trained in uh, South Africa or in, in Zimbabwe. And most majority of good technicians are coming from those two countries. But we, well, one would need to, to understand that the country of Botswana gives free education from pre-primary to tertiary education. Now, uh, with our college, which is linked to a, um, a going concern in the automotive industry, uh, we are able to um, train people uh, in a manner that they, are, they fit snugly into industry upon completion of their uh, their training and uh, because of uh, the way we are accredited uh, our young college has become so popular to the extent that as we speak 
the Botswana government is benchmarking its operations through our college. We have already attracted the uh, students from the Botswana Defense Forces. We have attracted um, students from the Botswana Central Transport Organization, and we, we are talking to the, we are um, talks are at an advanced stage uh, with the Botswana Police Services. Now, uh, so far, we this college is running at certificate level, and it has developed um, diploma programs which are now at um, ninety percent completion, and. Um, uh, we are operating from rented premises. Our aim was to, uh, our aim, and the aim for us looking for funding is to uh, develop a center of excellence where we would be able to have tra uh, training facilities and, and then practice as a going concern within the same campus. Um, uh, to train artisans in the automotive industry. And the government of Botswana is willing to sponsor, to, uh, to, to, to finance the tuition for all the enrollees, whoever uh, comes, uh, whoever qualifies to, be, um, uh, to meet the standards of um, the Botswana government entry points will be funded by the government of Botswana. And um, they fund these from certificate level, uh, from diploma level upwards. So as we speak right now, we, we have students from Zimbabwe, students from uh, uh, South Africa and Nigeria, as well as students from Botswana. So this college has a serious, serious um, um, potential in the country because SADIC is looking towards industrialization and industrialization, particularly in the automotive sector cannot happen without artisans uh, and proper artisans in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the country. Like right now, Botswana, this one will be the, one of the first colleges that offers, offers relevant technical education in the automotive industry. Yes. And so, I, I yes, cannot we are looking for, yeah. right, we are, we are looking for, um, um, uh, uh, three point, uh, three point eight, which is about fifty six million, um, Pula to dip to. Uh, we have identified a place already, which we have, has been offered to us to build that place and um, uh, and uh, into that center of excellence, and uh, then we we finish the accreditation of the diploma degree programs. Which is running into about close to two million pula, and um, uh, the revenue for this. If, if, if we manage to do the the initial setup that we uh, uh, with uh, with the proper funding right now, we will be able to generate uh, around thirty eight million pula this twenty uh, the, the 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 last part of this year when we have an intake between now and September. Um, we'll be able to get 38 million pula, and our costs for the same period will be around 12 million pula. Uh, going ahead into 2020, um, uh, 2021, our revenue is uh, uh, will be at um, uh, 132 million pula. Uh, this is when all, uh, all our uh, diploma and degree programs will be up and running with the uh, with the fees in the market, uh, and our running costs for that same period will be thirty eight point five million pula. In twenty in twenty twenty two, uh, we will have we, our our projections are sitting at one hundred and forty one point six million pula operating um, uh, income uh, operating expenses being um, uh, 46.4 million polar. Uh, these, these figures that we have just mentioned, this is what is, uh, the, these are the going pr uh, prices in the, in the, in the market. So we, we really would want to, uh, to see the success. We already have um, um, uh, a serious inquiries from Namibia trying to copy what we, are, what we have been accredited because SAD SADIC is headquartered here. We presented our, our model to SADIC and the head of SADIC Secret uh, Educational Secretariat 
um, uh, has linked us with the members of the SADC community and uh, Namibia has already made inquiries that if we, when we finish here, we need to set up in, uh, in Namibia. But meantime, they, will bring, they are working on bringing students to this college. And uh, Angola as well. Yes, no, that's very, as well. That's very good. That's very helpful. Uh, how many students do you currently have enrolled? Right now, we have uh, 46 uh, uh, from uh, 46 students who are uh, currently enrolled from government. We have uh, members of the defense. Uh, uh, in total, we have about 76 uh, students currently. Okay, thank you. And um, no, I, I just want to say thank you for the overview. I I strongly believe in technical trade schools, technical colleges around the world. Uh, you know, the world went through a 30, 40 year period where uh, you know, more fine arts degrees and things were popular. And, uh, and many of them have struggled to find employment, especially uh, in an, a rapidly emerging uh, world marketplace in a, a digital economy. And, uh, and so I think giving tangible trade skills where people can apply them and you've also obviously created the relationships with the public uh, public sector or the private sector with the automotive that's uh, important and so well done it sounds like you just are looking for a, a campus uh and along with uh, a number of other things but uh, thank you for sharing uh your your business and congratulations on the work that you've done thank you very much thank you yeah thank you so much Webstein, Vivian, um, just to build on to what Dr. Roland has just said, um, I think your position in yourself, not just for the Southern African region, but what is, is really uh, important and at hand for Africa's cycle of growth. Right now in Africa, we need to move into higher value chains, moving actually from consumption to production, and we need skills for industry. We don't need as many white collar jobs as we need technical jobs because we need to build industry, people who can go into the various sectors and build those sectors and the technical know-how, the hands-on sure. skills. So I think you're sure. onto that. And um, even as you put your plans for the center of excellence, you know, think about replication, scalability, and things like those. Congratulations again. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I think next on my on my screen. Um, sorry, there was somebody who was ready to go, right? Who was that? This one was ready to go. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Wilbert. Hello. Yes, can you please hear me? Go yes, Wilbert. Yeah. Uh, uh, Wilbert is going to go right now, and then Chris, you'll be after that. Uh, so, Wilbert, please. All right. No, thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Robas. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Very good. Um, nice meeting you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, I'd like to talk about a project that is not running at the moment. But it is a project that um, that uh, we think is very viable. Um, this is blade makers in 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 Botswana. Now, what we would like to 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 suggest is that you look at this project as a as a a new project which which requires five million uh, US dollars to fund. Let me give you some introduction. My name is Wilbert Garaba. I, I am a Zimbabwean, but I am a Zimbabwean who is now resident in Botswana. So this project will be based in Botswana. Let me give you also a background of where I come from. We had a company in Zimbabwe called uh, Gaba Industries, and that company was actually manufacturing blades. And these blades, um, I'll, I'll talk about them later. The, the company ran for 15 years, but it went down, as you know, Zimbabwean economy uh, is not doing very well at the moment. So we ended up having to close that operation. So this idea of, a new pro of this project is actually not new. We, we've got the experience and we know we've got the know-how, we know the market, we know the size, uh, um, and, and we know what we need to do. The, 
the products we are talking about in terms of manufacturing uh, include uh, uh, blades for for wood cutting, for metal cutting, for paper, for plastics, um, and so on. In fact, if you want to understand the products, it is important to, to go through it this way. Any product that is manufactured um, in this world has to go through some processes in the production process. One of the processes is the actual cutting of the product. Whether you are making paper or plastics or wood or, or textiles or um, leather or whatever, you have to cut the product. And this product is called a machine knife. We actually call, call them industrial knives. So when we're talking about blade makers, we're talking about manufacturing of industrial knives. These are not domestic knives. And I thought I needed to explain that uh, clearer. Now, um, the raw materials that we need to manufacture will be uh, accessed not necessarily in this area in Botswana. We've got some suppliers in South Africa, but they are not adequate. We would have to be importing the raw material from Austria, from uh, Brazil, uh, from Germany, and, um, and from Japan. These are the main manufacturers of what we call tool steel, which is the manufacturing company, the, 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 um, the raw material required for making these products. Um, we, we, we know the markets. We have, uh, we, when we were running the company in Zimbabwe, before we, we closed it, we were actually supplying the whole of Zimbabwe. We were actually a monopoly in Zimbabwe. Um, we were also supplying about 15, uh, 25 to 30% of our product to South Africa. And we were now exporting to the South region, which is Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi, Botswana, and so on. Um, so the market is quite wide. We are not looking at, lo at localized market. Botswana itself is actually not a, a very big market in terms of the product because this product depends on, on highly industrialized uh, economies. And Botswana is not, we would regard it as, as a low industrialized uh, country. South Africa is the biggest market in the region, obviously. Um, and then you would be looking at the rest of Africa as a market. In fact, to be quite honest with you, this product um, is actually being imported into, so into, into Africa, most of it, because nobody actually manufactures this product, except for one company in South Africa, which was and will be our competitor. And as far as uh, Africa is concerned, even as far as West Africa is concerned, we are aware that... Uh, they are importing this product as machine spares from, from mainly from Europe and also from India and China. Thank you. So this is a very unique product um, and we are looking at uh, uh, the value of investment of about 5 million US dollars and that money will be used for A, the purchasing of equipment and if I can go into the equipment, the equipment required would be sourced from countries like China and especially Germany and Taiwan. They do manufacture the special equipment that we need to manufacture industrial knives. Um, we, we are looking at a, uh, a very wide range of products. And in terms of establishing in Botswana, we would actually be requiring to establish a new plant altogether. This is not a running company, as I, as I indicated earlier on, we would have to establish a plant, a, a complete plant, where we import the, the raw material and the production of, of this Botswana operation will, will literally be for export. Botswana itself will consume very little of the production. The reason why we would like to, to establish this, pro, this uh, product, uh, the production in Botswana, is because Botswana is a very stable economy. We have got a, uh, experience, I've been here for the last 10 years or so. Botswana is actually a very stable economy, it was very stable labor force. Um, the location of this project could actually have been in Zimbabwe or South Africa, but for various reasons, we think that Botswana is the best place to locate this product. 
Um, I think essentially this is roughly the, the nature of the projects. I don't know if you've got any questions. Well, we thank you for, for sharing your heart and your passion. Uh, you know, if you had not already owned this kind of business in Zimbabwe, I would say that this is way too big of a risk for an investor. But because you already have, you've done it, it's what you know, uh, you know what you need to, to do well and you know that market. And I know that the right person, someone with your skill set, that this can be a very lucrative niche. I have seen this type of industrial uh, niche be extremely profitable. And also because the barrier to entry is high, you don't have a whole lot of competitors. Like you said, you'll just have one or two other major competitors and that's it because of the investment, but also because of the information knowing how to do this efficiently, uh, economically, uh, because not everybody has millions of dollars to, you know, try to start something that they don't know much about. So uh, one uh, bit of uh, encouragement I would say is to, and I'm not asking you the question right now, I, I don't want you to answer for time's sake, I want you to think about it for August, uh, but that is how, uh, what is the cheapest cost you can actually start in Botswana? You may come to the conclusion and say, you know, technically, uh, I could rent a place and then buy the uh, equipment. Maybe it's used equipment, and but maybe I can get started for fifty thousand or a hundred thousand. Or you may have a different number of where can I start, uh, and then investors uh, may add money as you go along and as you have milestones, the second round of funding or a third round of funding where you upgrade machinery, upgrade equipment, upgrade location, but there's proof, proof of concept, there's proof of demand, proof of consumer demand. Uh, it gives you time to refine your logistics, how much you spend on delivery, shipping, all of these uh, variables that really uh, impact the sustainability of your business. So Wilbert, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, very unique niche, and you obviously have the insight and a successful track record. And I look forward to seeing you in August as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I comment? Just Please. One or two and <laughs> to Mr. Rowland and and Nyakan, in our group here are some of the entrepreneurs who have not yet made their submissions. We close them outside, but we are going into the second round of submissions. So we are expecting Mr. Kharaba's project to come through. So I just thought I should highlight that. I think I have one or two others. There should be three here. We felt we should invite them into this meeting so that they get all the information because now they will have limited time to prepare the executive summary and the business plan for August. So I thought I should just make that clarification. And thank you, Mr. Wilbert, for having come through and shared with us. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, thank thank you. very you much. Can, eh? you can, if I could just make a comment. Yes, go ahead. I think, I think that this is one of those unique, uh, unique projects. I mean, uh, apart from it just being uh, capital intensive, if you look at the nature of the product also, we are looking at actually supplying other, other, other industries. So it's very unique and uh, well, but well done for the thought. And the good thing is that you've got experience. You, you know why you did not succeed in, in Zimbabwe. Yeah? And therefore you learn from those, uh, from those experiences. But now when you do your final, your final uh, paper is to, to show very clearly the projections in terms of cash flows. Uh, maybe very heavy investment initially, but you need to see that, that uh, the cash flows for a couple of years to see whether, um, to look at what's the minimum you need now to set up the business. Yeah, because you know, it, it is, for me, it's, it's a long term sort of business, you know, setting up the business, and then getting the market, and then the cash flows coming in. So you need to be, be very careful in terms of your forecast, in terms of what you require now, and how you see the, the money is flowing back into, into the business, and therefore being able to, to make investors happy. But otherwise, well done, it's a great idea. Thank you very much. Eh? Chris, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Hi, this is Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my project is a simple one, if I may say so. It involves uh, tire retrading. And uh, this will focus mainly on truck tires and passenger bus tires. Now, the reason I got into, into, into this project, or rather I chose this project, is because I looked at the import bill that Botswana has on importation of tires. And it, it, it spends, Botswana spends almost 150 million hula on tires. That is used tires, new tires, and retrades. These are just truck tires and bus tires, not the small cars and the small uh, vehicles. And I noticed that out of that, about 8 million, or rather, yeah, 8 million is spent on retraded and an annual figure of 29 million is what Botswana spends on all these tires. We are looking for 1.7, close to 1.7 million US dollars to set up a factory to start retrading tires. I have experience in retrading tires, having worked for Dunlop for about six years in Zambia that time Dunlop was operating. So I thought this would be the best uh, uh, project for me to go into. And looking at the amount of money that the bus operators and truckers are spending just on buying new tires is just too much. By us introducing this project in Botswana, the government will have saved or will save close to half of what they're spending now. And we're looking at the market being the people who are using new tires and the people who are using retraded tires, which is a very small number, and we know why that is. But I won't get into all those details because I know there are a lot of people who want to do their presentations. I just want the doctor to advise on what he thinks this would do to Botswana or as a project itself, if, if there would be funders out there who would be interested. I know through my research that America actually is very much on retraded tires. Yes. And I just want to, yeah, I just want to hear from you what do you think this would bring to Botswana? Well, I think it's a great business uh, and, and it falls into a, 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 an aspect of a service business uh, that there will always be demand for. And, but they think about it a little bit differently here. And so investors would have a hard time uh, swallowing 1.7 million uh, investment for a retread factory uh, to start with. However, uh, what a lot of retread places in America, like even in, in most major cities, there are at least 10, maybe 20 or 30 shops that sell retread tires uh, or used tires. So they, they do their own patching or maybe they, they, they buy retreads from someone else uh, or maybe they have, some of them have a very small retread shop kind of in their automotive repair business. Uh, and so if I would recommend you looking at how much can a, 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 a one retread machine cost where you're maybe pumping out a handful of tires a day, and then you can retail those and sell those, uh, you know, right there in, in, starting in, in Botswana and other places. And as demand grows, then you buy a second machine, a third machine, and you're hiring people to run those because you don't want to build uh, there was a back in the 2000s, the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, big investors kind of uh, because of the dot com bubble and other things, they got uh, sour on the build it and they will come philosophy of business. And so a lot of new entrepreneurs, they think if I have this factory, if I have this stadium, if I have this arena, if I have this campus, then uh, people will continue to buy. Uh, and, and, and the problem is they investors have already tried that. Uh, and most of the time it, customers do not come. <laughs> so they build all of this infrastructure and then they just have a very expensive paperweight because they don't have enough customers to support it. It is a much wiser approach to start small, build your customer base and then let the demand uh, exceed your capacity. And then you come to investors saying, I am turning away business because I don't have enough machines or equipment or a large enough factory to service them. And investors will throw money at you at that point because you've already created the demand. So that would be my encouragement. You're on the right track. 
It is a great business. Uh, and it's a, and once again, it's a, it's a, a niche that um, is not going to go away. And it does not matter if there's a pandemic, if people have a flat tire uh, and their cash flows, uh, you know, are, are tight, they don't want to buy a new tire. Uh, I've bought used tires. I in college one time I had to buy, you know, and uh, I've bought used tires before. There was a vehicle I was going to trade in, in in a couple months and, and I did not want to put, a, you know, $2,000 worth of tires on the car. So I'll put, you know, $200 worth of used tires just to get me by for a few months until I trade the vehicle in. So it is a great, a great business and uh, wish you uh, great success there. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roland. I have a, a, one or two questions for you, Chris. One, um, as you thought about going into retread tires, you know, um, you know, I know the idea could work uh, in America and in the West, but also looking at the quality of roads, you know, the quality and then and the lifespan of the roads, you know, when you look at you know some of the developed nations and some of the the, the infrastructure, um, you know, state and needs within our continent, how, what is the state of roads, you know, um, on your you know in your country and and how have you taken that into consideration in terms of like used tires and and, and the retread tires uh, you know and the cost of actually keeping them you know well you know uh, producing you know you know retread and 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 good quality enough to 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 handle the kinds of roads that we have in africa have you thought about that actually actually that is where my research started I have a complete um, business plan done already. Great. Uh, then that means that our, the technical uh, team and analysts will be able to review what you have. Mm. Very good. Okay. Okay. Who's coming up next? We've got about like 15 to 20 minutes to go through the remaining, um, you know, uh, projects, projects. So please, if, if you would love to introduce yourself, your project, go ahead, unmute the, the mic and, and, and go ahead. Hi, hi, Nathan. can I go next? Yes, hi, Bona. Hi, um, my name is Mwangala Bona. I'm a um, computer scientist. Uh, who's a, a computer scientist with an MBA. I'm Zambian. I was actually on the call before with the Zambians. Um, I've got two projects which I've submitted their executive summaries for. The first one is, is, is in IT. Uh, uh, as a computer scientist, I have actually two licenses to do with, with IT. I have a franchise for developing mobile apps, uh, websites, and for doing SE, SEO for businesses. And I also have a license as a tour operator in Zambia. So I want to come at that from the IT part to be the one advertising Zambia on the internet and things like that. So on the IT part, I want to have a, a design house. Um, so most of the funding uh, I'm looking for for this is to do with building capacity, uh, um, staffing, marketing, and things like that. Uh, I'm already working in, in IT with the, with the license that I have, uh, so mostly it's for business development. And then the second one is is in is in agro processing. Uh, this one, uh, the IT one, with the license, I can operate basically anywhere in the world. So I'm looking to focus on Zambia and Botswana. Uh, the second one, the second um, application is for an agro-processing company called ESA Foods, which I'm looking to, to base in Zambia. My focus will be on beekeeping because I want to produce honey. I'm a beekeeper already. I have five hives as of now. Um, I've already made contact with a group of 32 women in in Zambia uh, who I'm looking at like one cluster of outgrowers in a place called light, uh, please. and then close the doors in a the bit cold in a place called Kabwe in Zambia so 
um, I'm looking at this to to work with them to supply them with with all the hives and all the equipment, and then I do the processing and I buy the honey from them and then process and and sell it. And then also around that, I I um, I also want to to add value to products like nuts and dried fruits and maybe. Um, uh, like put honey and nuts together and then package them somehow. Um, I would like to build some kind of processing plant for this. I have land already in Zambia and um, I've already made contact. I have trainers, but I haven't really started with this project yet fully. Uh, those are the two main projects I have for the uh, agro processing one. For each cluster of outgrowers, I'm looking about 25 US dollars, 25,000 US dollars for the outgrowers um, uh, set. Um, uh, yeah, so that's like the gist of my two projects. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. How much are you asking on the IT uh, app and website development company? Um, 20,000 US 50, for business development yeah, and expansion. Yeah. Okay, and how much, uh, what, how much is uh, your current revenue? Uh, I haven't, I'm just working on these on individual uh, projects. I haven't really put it together. I haven't um, compiled the, the revenue per year because it's been isolated projects I just do for people. So now I want to put it as uh, under one business. So I don't have those figures yet because it's like a startup okay. idea. Sure. Uh, I would recommend for August, go ahead and take the, the projects you've done on the side, uh, the just one-off projects, and add those up. And, and even if it's over the course of two or three years, say I just did it part-time, but this is how much revenue I was doing before deciding this needed to be full time. Um, you know, and that way there is a baseline of existing clients, uh, the history of existing clients you can show and, and revenue. Uh, also that will help your credibility a lot when you can show samples of projects that you have done, uh, apps you've developed or websites that you've created. So very good. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Wangala. They're very helpful and um, uh, certainly, you're you're in a good price range to you know for for uh, for funding so thank you thank you all right who who do we have next that has not gone that would like to we have a few minutes left for that danny Good afternoon. Good day. Yeah, my name is Danny Guduri. I am from Botswana, but uh, I'm a Malawian citizen. I've been working in Botswana as an accountant for almost 20 years. We have a project with a, and a company called the Eastcom Investments. Uh, this project is a tourism project, which is in Maung, in the Kavango Delta. Uh, it's an existing project which is offered to our company to buy, to buy in. Uh, we want to take over the project. It's a small, small scale project, but it has potential for expansion. So there is a program, extensive expansion program, uh, which includes uh, uh, an ex to buy an existing land, which is almost 109 hectares for development. There is the existing owners who will be part of our team uh, to operating uh, company and they have wide experience in the tour operating system, Safari. 
and we have put together uh, an expansion program to this to incorporate the whole of the Okavango region by buying concession from the uh, village development committees and put up uh, lodges or buy in existing lodges so that our network should be expanded to, uh, to incorporate uh, all the needs of all the tourists who come in Botswana. The current system is most of tourists, when they come into Botswana, their booking is done outside Botswana and money is paid outside Botswana. But we are putting up a network which uh, everything will be done in Botswana using this new network of uh, tour operating system. And there are also other hotels which are uh, on sale, which have been offered to our company. So this will be part of the expansion program of this project. And the benefits uh, to this is that the communities also, there is an income generating, a sharing of the profits with the communities where we are going to be buying the concessions which are uh, released out from the government. Mm -hmm. We are looking yes. at... Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so you're, let me make sure I get this right. You're, you already have a tourism business, yes? Yeah, we are buying into a tourism business. Okay, so you're looking for funds to buy into a tour, an existing tourism business. Yes, and there is an expansion program because the owners, they couldn't expand, but there's this potential. That's why they want us to come in, take over the business and incorporate these new ideas and this expansion program within the same structure. Okay. And so how much, do you know how much the business is doing right now in revenue before your expansion program? Oh, the existing one is almost doing half a million US dollars per annum. Okay. And, but uh, yeah. The other two other hotels, which are also existing, which can be incorporated in, uh, the other one is almost doing about $7 million per annum, and they have audited accounts which we have perused. And how much funding are you seeking? Uh, to complete the whole program, it will need almost 133 million US dollars, but it will be over a period of time because the expansion will not be just at once. And is that to build out the safari experience? Or uh, yeah, this group which we are incorporating in, they have the Safari Business Network. So they will be part of our team. Okay, so just so that I'm clear, they're currently doing, between the hotel and safaris, around $7.5 million yes. per year. Per and, annum, yes. Yes, and then they are seeking $133 million. Uh, yes. Over time. Uh, make sure when you present in August and on and, and the documents for the business analysts and, and so forth, that you break down the uh, investment stages because that sounds like a full funding package as opposed to, uh, you know, the, 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 the C round and a first round and a second round, you know, so that will really want to be broken down and, and, okay. sh and show uh, whatever the first round amount is, let's just say it's, you know, $5 million, uh, then for 5 million, this is how far the business gets, you know, for $27 million, this is how far we get. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, all the way up to, if you tell us how much it would cost to do the whole thing, it's 133 million. So I would just build that stair step on, uh, on okay. no more than three or four investment levels. But it gives investors a, a, a range that they maybe feel comfortable in. There's a lot of investors who don't mind helping you get to here, but then they need a different kind of investor, a more seasoned investor 
or a larger institutional investor to kind of invest from here above. Okay. Yeah, very good. Congratulations. Uh, sounds like you have a great program that obviously they wanted to bring you in for on the expansion. And um, so wish you great success there. Thank you. Thank you. Now you can, I'll turn it to you. Oh yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Dr. Roland. Yeah, I would have wanted um, Steve to speak into mergers and acquisitions because that's his area of expertise as well, but um, I don't see him on the call. Steve, are you on the call? Actually, I'm on the call, I'm on the call. Sorry, I was having some challenges with my internet. Sure. But uh, I'm, I'm on the call now. And uh, Danny, Danny, that's, uh, it's quite some significant investment you're looking for here. And uh, you, you, I'm sure you, you and your colleague, you say you're an accountant. I'm sure you have a vision of what you want to see, how you want to see this business develop. So when you're going into partnerships of this nature, you've got to make sure that your vision and the current owner's vision is properly aligned. Others along the way, you may start having uh, differences in terms of strategy. It's extremely yeah. important that you get aligned from day one. And uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the funding required, again, we've got to be, to be very very clear that actually what the current owners are looking at yeah, okay. is to expand the business. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of usage of these funds, you've got to be very clear what you get, what exactly is it going to 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 be doing for the business. Yeah. Um, so the critical thing I can just tell you here is alignment in terms of vision and strategy is, is extremely important. And then monitoring the usage of these funds is again extremely important. And I believe you've done your research, you've done your appraisal of the current performance of this business. Yeah. Yes, we have done that. There are no big holes in this business. You know, sometimes people want to offload a business to a partner because they want to cover up a hole that they have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've got to make sure the money is actually going to, to productive activities and not to kind of deal with past history of. Uh, of, of issues there. Eh? So that, that's really what I can advise you of at, at, at the moment. So when you come back in August, okay. cover all these angles so that we are okay. quite sure that which, whichever investor comes to support you, they're clear, confident that the money is actually going to grow the business and not to go and fund some of these things that could have gone wrong in the past the business. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Any other insights um, from any member of the team on generally, you know, that nature of business? Um, as we plan now to move on to... Um, Nagan, there's one hand raised. Uh, Lucy? Yeah, go ahead. Whose hand is that? Go ahead. Let me unmute her. Lucy, Lucy Falage. Okay, we can we can move on. Okay, thank you, thank you for that, Dr. Roland. Um, so I next, can... on... yes, Michelle, go ahead. Uh, I would like to just reiterate on something Steve has said that I think is important. He has mentioned about diversion of funds. Some of our responses to the preliminary review are that the usage of funds is not so clear and some of them look like, from the presentation, how it looks like there could be diversion. So they need to curb that risk in how they, they, they will bring back for the second preliminary review. We actually captured that in some of them. And it's not because they are actually diverting, but it's how you present it that makes it look like that. Thank you, that's all. Yeah, no, makes sense, um, Michelle, thank you. Thank you for that, thank you for that. Um, anyone else who would love to introduce themselves and hasn't got a chance to speak yet? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can.
you can hear me. Yes, we can. Go yes, ahead. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm having a problem here with my internet. I'm in a village. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Lucy. Yes, Lucy, go ahead. I just wanted to present my business. It is a new business. I've not yet started it, but I've put in a proposal. It's a get mapping company in Botswana. And this was established in 2015. The main purpose for this is to just provide various mapping services through the geographical information system. Uh, in fact, I've worked for the Department of Surveys and Mapping in Botswana for over 30 years. And my main job here, there were to the production of, of maps. But now I've, I have this company now, which I now think that I've got um, the opportunity now where I can use these services because I have realized that in Botswana, not many people are able to read maps. And I've also realized that there are so many businesses that um, people don't know where these things are located. And it becomes a problem for many business or projects that are in the country. So I thought getting this opportunity with my technical expertise on your geo, spatial information, maybe I can now produce Google Maps to show all these projects which are being made in Botswana. And the other thing for me is to primarily uh, go to government institution, private uh, institution also to, to, to train people on the use of this technology where they can find where certain things can be found for using the Google Maps. So my project has not really started. The only thing that I've just done was to, to introduce myself to various government departments, uh, the Ministry of Lands and Housing, the um, agricultural departments, and tourism, just to show them how their products can be assessed by other people through the use of the Google Maps or the geographical information system. So the most important thing for me here now is to get um, equipments how I can, I mean, to get funds to, to, to get some equipment, especially this, um, the Google Maps and also the, 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 the softwares, the computers that I can use, the printers and all those kind of things. So these are the things, it's a, it's a product that is just starting and I really wanted to start at a small scale, then later on I can go on and on. And this, I feel that Later on in my plan or in my project proposal, as I'll be presenting this, maybe perhaps you can look at it and see how best I can start. Thank you, if at all I've made sense. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, it, was, it was great to hear your plan. And I, you know, we do look forward to, to seeing all of this in, in the executive summaries and the information. And just going through this process uh, with the team will help you further refine uh, your idea and kind of give you the right places to go ahead and start um, that don't require a lot of capital, uh, but that you're able to start your business and start getting customers. Uh, and, and, and so I think there's a lot of value in doing that. Even if there's not a lot of revenue, it just shows uh, that your services are needed and that people are willing to buy that service uh, from you or from your company. Uh, so thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for starting a business and for uh, following, you know, your entrepreneurial dream there. Is there anyone else uh, that would like to share? Tonight, I think uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, Hi. Hi, Michelle. Yeah. Hello, hi. Okay, Michelle, go ahead and go and deny uh, Mashababi if you'll 
uh, go next, that would be great. Michelle, please, the floor is yours. Okay, actually, my name is Lorraine. Okay. Can you hear me, guys? We can, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Lorraine. I'm based in South Africa, originally from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, by profession, I'm a risk analyst. But then, um, last year in 2019, I decided to start up a clothing brand. Mm -hmm. Uh, to follow my passion because I had been doing that since I was very young. Um, uh, my family had the clothing, a manufacturing uh, clothing shop. So um, the name of my brand is uh, Lolo D. Um, so what we do is we design and manufacture uh, unique and uh, high quality ready to wear clothing. Um, we infuse we infuse uh, African African uh, print into our current uh, street style clothing to distinct ourselves from the um, 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 competitors on the market. So um, we're very fortunate because of the quality and the uniqueness of our clothing brand to supply. Um, um, one of uh one of the stores in south africa called uh yde stores so um we uh we we're supposed to supply like uh five of their stores but because of um of a uh, lack of capital uh we uh, we couldn't increase our production we couldn't supply the five uh stores that were allocated to us so we managed to supply two of their stores. One of the stores was in Santin Mall, and the other one was in Mall of Africa, both uh, in Jobbik. So we couldn't like supply other stores in Cape Town, uh, Deben and Pretoria because, uh, because of lack of capital and um, we we're very limited to produce, uh, we couldn't co produce larger quantities. So, um, uh, at the moment, we, have, uh, we, we are looking for funding for, to buy machinery, uh, more industrial machinery and uh, quilting machinery, uh, embroidery machinery and fabric laser machinery. Uh, the reason why, uh, why we, are, we, have, uh, we are facing a lot of demand because, is because uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the clothing market in in South, in South Africa, or should I say in Southern Africa, uh, is because of the influx of, uh, of clothing, of clothing, of clothing, um, of imports. Most people are importing from Asia and, peop and uh, most of the imports is deemed of low quality. So that's why most people are preferring to, to, purchase, to purchase from us. So, uh, um, so the company's goal in, in the next year is to make an, over, an overwhelming impact in this, sorry. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, how much can, are you, re yes, we can. How much are you, funding are you requesting? Okay, at the moment we're looking at, uh, it's between 100,000 and 200,000 US dollars when we are purchasing a uh, brand new machinery. But uh, if we're looking at uh, second-hand machinery, uh, it will be between 50000 and 80000 US dollars. Okay. And how much revenue are you currently doing on an annual basis? Okay. Um, so from, uh, because we started in May 2019, uh, so we have currently made uh, something like uh, between 5000 and 10000 US dollars. Okay, and but you are in two stores currently, including yes. the Mall of Africa, yes. and you can go to five with that chain uh, when you have enough product. Is that correct? Yes. Very so we're supposed to supply like five stores, but because of of limited production, uh, because we're currently small, uh, operating on a small scale, we couldn't supply uh, the five stores. We, we only managed to supply the. We're all, we can for now currently we are only supplying only two uh, two stores 
Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We appreciate it. And I look forward to the details on, on the business. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, now can we have one final, uh, at least, uh, uh, presenter before we turn to Michelle to go through everything? Uh, and that is Denai. Uh, so, uh, Meshavavi, uh, please proceed. Denai? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, my name is Danai Mashavavi. Yes, I'm I'm here to uh, to represent my uh, project, which is the Joseph's Farms. So Joseph's Farms is oh, is a owned by Tule uh, is not is a project which is not currently running, but we only have a land which we have. Uh, which is about 20 hectares. This land is situated uh, uh, about 40 kilometers from Malape uh, near Red Sele. And we have uh, this land uh, is in a favorable uh, a place because it is uh, in its vicinity. We are, we are, it's like we are, we have got a dam, which is a big dam. We supplies more than six villages. So the, the Joseph's farm is not yet currently running because uh, uh, now the, we still need the, the, uh, the funding, the capital funds for us to be able to run this project. And oh, this farm, this uh, project was named after the Joseph, the Joseph in the Bible. If you know Joseph who is in the Bible, who, uh, who came in, in a crisis, because of wisdom that which he receives from God, he was able to save the na his nation and also other nations from a crisis in the time of famine. So this is where uh, uh, this is where the name of the project was derived from. So it is a project which we thought also even as in Botswana, we know that uh, uh, since we want to specialize on a uh, uh, on horticultural farming, which is uh, mainly focusing on the produce of vegetables, uh, to also to able to come in and uh, uh, bridge in the gap of able to supply the local markets. Since we know that here we need, uh, here we are the, with the current projects which we have currently, we are not able to supply the current markets, the, the, the local markets. So, we believe that if we be able to get the finances as just a farm, farm, we'll be able to come in and bridge in that gap. So uh, the owners of the, we are, I'm in partnership with Esther Ramasene, uh, and we're also working with the, the daughter. We also have a, the daughter of Esther, who, uh, who holds a, a degree in, in, the, in, in farming. Uh, so we believe that she will also be able to come in and help us. So in, on the technical team, uh, I have here where, uh, Mr. Kenny will also be able to come in and be able to uh, explain the technical part on how we, are, uh, we have planned to use the funding uh, as soon as we be able, uh, as we able to, to, uh, uh, to become liquid. So now, uh, so this uh, yeah, and the objective of this uh, of this justice farming is not only to is only also to, or not only also to supply the the market of Botswana, but also we also even wants to 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 export and also will be a, a will be desiring to process some also some vegetables which will be able to exp to export to. Uh, even outside Botswana. So we believe that as ladies, we can also be able to do it as the leaders with also some men who will be also working behind us, helping us even on the technical part. Thank you. Because, uh, and our targeted markets, we are also targeting the government markets, uh, the commercial markets and the exports. So uh, on the government market will be 
we are targeting like private schools uh, and government schools, hospitals, uh, and in, on the commercial markets, we are targeting the supermarkets, the restaurants, and the wholesalers. So, oh, on the, uh, so right now, with your permission, I want to hand over the mic to Mr. Ken, who will also be able to explain further on the technical part on how we are going to use our land, how we are going to apportion it so that we'll be able to get the returns. Okay, well, hold on uh, one moment, Denai, before we do that. And my apologies, Mr. Ken. Uh, for sake of time, I just have a couple of questions and then we have to move on. Uh, my question is, how much funding are you requesting? Six million, six million pula. Okay, and uh, very good. And then I just want to say, uh, you mentioned the reference of how you derived the name of the Joseph's farm. And uh, because he was ruler uh, during a time of famine and had plenty. Uh, but as an entrepreneur, I will also, uh, we all know what happened before he got there. Uh, he went through a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of impossible scenarios. Uh, maybe he never thought he'd get out of the, the pit or he thought he'd never get out of the prison. <laughs> uh, so uh, just know that on your entrepreneurial journey, as you're going through this process, uh, you're going through the same thing he did, trials and tribulations, but, uh, but that's what entrepreneurship is about, knowing that at the end, uh, you know, there is a vision of victory. That's why we do what we do. And so, so stick with it, and we look forward to bringing you along through the process. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, at the, uh, yes. Yes. At this time, uh, Michelle, I believe, uh, unless I can uh, interject, uh, I think we'd like to turn it over to you to start going through the next steps and showing all of them uh, feedback from what they have submitted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nolan. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for all those who have presented. We have had and we have looked at the summaries that have been sent. And every idea that has been given is amazing. Amazing, amazing. Like, I'm happy to see the entrepreneurial mindset in Botswana is really good. And I would just like to point at one thing. A financial investor is like your finance, partner is it's, it's like you're getting into a financial marriage for a financial marriage to work you need to be transparent you need to speak you know you need to say everything and one of the things that we noted with most of the submissions was lack of transparency actually conservativeness when it comes to money matters if you want someone to trust you if you with their money you need to trust them with your money. You get it. Like you need to tell them very clearly what you want, how much you want, what you needed for the complete breakdown. And the biggest challenge with the executive summaries, most of them was lack of transparency. We noted that it was unclear how long the company has been in operations. It is unclear what the sales and marketing strategy is. So most of the ideas, I mean, agro processing, manufacturing, you know, you are all gearing to, many of them were gearing towards, you know, killing, I mean, dealing with food insecurity, food security, poverty erad eradication, et cetera, which is great and amazing. But, how they were presented was a bit conservative. So what we're going to give is feedback on how to, what needs to be captured when you do the second resubmission, because we do have a second phase where you resubmit everything. And that's by July, July 10th. You're supposed to have submitted uh, for the second phase. So I will start with, um, frequently asked questions before I go to a summary of some of them. Now, I would like to share the page on the, I'd like to share this with everyone so that you can see my screen on the frequently asked questions. 
And before I proceed, there are two phases in the analysis of your requests. The first phase is the preliminary review, which is what we have done, and this is what we are giving feedback about. And then the second phase is the uh, uh, deep stick analysis, the deep analysis of the project. So this was just uh, looking at it on top, just viewing a few things, the basics here and there. Now, the frequently asked questions, the first thing is, is it mandatory to have all the requirements in the checklist? The second phase has a checklist of documents that you're supposed to submit. And the answer is, it is necessary to adhere to the maximum number of documents. Not all of them, I, I, you might not be able to have all of them, but the maximum number, transparency. The other question is, is it mandatory to add industry required documents? Yes, it is mandatory to adhere to the industry requirements, but it is not mandatory to have all the documents because you might not have all your ducks in a row because of one, two reasons. Some licenses might be in the, in the stage of procurement. So if you have receipts or anything to show that you're procuring the SAID licenses or whatever stage you are in the, progress, in the process, just state it. The third question is, how far and deep should I go in submission of project details? Guys, just give everything. I mean, related to the project, of course, just give everything that you have related to the project. If it's construction, even adding photos, it doesn't hurt. It, it, it even makes someone actually visualize, and we all know a picture is a thousand words. So if you have even for, just give what you have, whatever documentation you can have to make someone wear your shoes and understand why you have passion for what you desire. Um, how many will be funded per country is the fourth question. As many, as many as the investors deep fit if all of you are able to strengthen your proposal i'm sure you will get something they, they uh, dr nolan has been very clear they have the capacity to fund everywhere if everyone is able to just strengthen their proposal number five is there's a notion that many project owners submit all their documents but few get chosen is this true no do not be afraid of submitting your documents and i will say so answering with number six Number six is how confidential are the projects being handled during the virtual calls and selection process? Even as I speak and as we have spoken, you can see that we, there's no pointing of fingers. Like everything is just, it, it's, it's all about building you because we are here for advisory services. We're here to make sure that you get the best out of this process. Um, number seven is what do I expect in the virtual call? You expect that you will be given a preliminary feedback where you will all receive the feedback after the call through your team leader, of course, and you will get your feedback where we have given you responses to the, to the executive summary. Now that said, please do not feel like you get, do, do not dampen your spirit if you find your feedback is a bit brutally honest. To be honest with you, that feedback is supposed to build you because we are preparing you for August and August you won't have time to get your act together so you have now until August to get all your papers and everything in order to be able to just respond to questions promptly like um, Dr. Nolan said that the first thing they will ask is what do you do what is your revenue what is your profit how much do you want you need to have all those on your fingertips it, because it's about two minutes for your presentation. I mean, you just need to know your stuff and say it with all the passion. Actually, that's another thing. As you're presenting, please be passionate about that. Very passionate. The other question is, what is the next step after the virtual call and preliminary review feedback? Now, the next step after the preliminary review is a second review, which involves a deeper analysis, as mentioned, where the project you're supposed to sub, uh, submit supporting documents as per a required checklist. Now, everyone will get their checklist as said, and I will walk you through the checklist um, a little bit after this. How do we address language barriers? I have not noted any yet from the submissions. I think that everyone was very eloquent enough to, to do that in English. However, I'm sure your team leader will still guide the same should there be any such barriers. 
the, the other question is how many submissions will make it to the end now here it's not about nobody is being rejected from the preliminary review how we have categorized is that no one gets there's no rejection however we have categorized from the strongest to the one that requires um strengthening and some of the you'll find that some of them that require strengthening you're in that category not because the idea is bad not because you know you don't you 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 don't know what you're doing but just because you were not clear you know the amount and you know something was just not telling so you need to be able to express yourself properly on the pay on paper so that um you can make it to you can increase your chances and grow uh, go a notch higher in the category now what are the features that my proposal should have these are basic basic features purpose of the proposal this is uh, the purpose is i want twenty thousand dollars for a machine i want to buy equipment what is the objective of the proposal this is the equipment will be used for such and such and such which is solving the problem of such and such and such identified in the areas and sectors of such and such. What is uh, the amount sought? Uh, of course, that is important. And I think everyone at least was able to capture how much they want. Now, the other thing that is important is the breakdown of the funds. You might capture how much you want, but if you don't explain that you need $100,000 and you're not clear on how you're going to spend it, it raises questions, it raises grows. So you need to be able to explain $100,000, I'm gonna use 50,000 for working capital, 10,000 to buy equipment, uh, another, you know, 30,000 for commissioning of the, of the uh, plant, processing plant. You just need to be very clear on how you're spending the money. Uh, the other thing is marketing and distribution channels it's important it's important guys to just state how like um how you're going to reach the market how you have identified that you need to export how are you going about that do you have you have you already tested have you gone to whatever country you want to export to have what what has been the response you know you just need to be very clear that you have identified such and such a market and this is how we're distributing the products and such the other thing is competition. Um, it's important to identify your competition and what is your unique identifier? What is your competitive edge? You know, will you still be sustainable five years from today? Because this is not about just a project, it's, it's about sustainability. So if you get these funds, is it going to lift you and will you be able to just go up? and running after that after you pay back the funds or you know so your sustainability is important cash flow projections i will clarify more on that later statistics of past now this these are now what is required in the deeper analysis the the ones uh, i have just said that the ones we looked at in the executive summary but some people already gave statistics of their past performance in the executive summary where they were able to tell us our revenues for the last three years were x x x and we could see either they were dipping or they were growing so we were able to at least establish what they want and the way forward now supporting documents this is as per the checklist and i will advise on that too the other question is what happens if i don't have internet access during the tours, your contact team lead will be able to capture and, and advise on the meeting highlights, communicate the same to you. Uh, the other question is, how do I go about country statutory requirements? Now that uh, is, it, it, some of the things required in your checklist are statutory legal requirements as per your business, business permits, licenses, and all that. So if you're not conversant, I believe the country team leader can advise on the same about that. What do I need to do if I have projects in different countries? Please attend all the virtual tours of all the countries. If someone already has an existing loan from a bank or a microfinance, do they still qualify for funding? Yes, you do. You do. You qualify. However, you just need, you know, we're asking for your past financials. So we need to see a reflection of how you've been paying the previous loan. And you just need to show that 
once you're given this, this fund, you will be able to use it in a certain manner that will lift you and you will not struggle, yeah? You will not struggle to pay both of them. You just need to show that. Uh, small businesses might not have financial audited accounts. Do they stand a chance? Yes, you do. Small businesses still have bookkeeping. I know basic bookkeeping where you have your income, your expenses, and your margins, and your reserved revenue. I mean, they, they, there is basic bookkeeping. So please just share that with us in the place of uh, financially audited accounts. That said, I, I would like to move straight to the industry requirements. Industry requirements, we have, um, okay, now most of the basic documents in the checklist, I have put them into the uh, list of uh, industry requirements. So I will go through this. I'll start with construction. Now, the basic documents required in construction, and it's not limited to this because every organization is unique depending on how the project looks like. You might have different documentation, so please just submit all of it. Now, we have the basic KYCs. These are Certificate of Incorporation or Registration, um, Authenticated Copy of your Memorandum and Articles of Association, Director's ID and Passports, and your Trading License. I believe the same are also statutory requirements in your country. Um, again, we would like to have a copy of any current litigation that the company could be involved in for whatever matter. Uh, the investor would like to know that as well. Now, tax clearance certificate in the name of the company, a company profile, which is what, what has the organization been doing and what is it doing, uh, recent three-year audited accounts, which I had already mentioned before in the, in the frequently asked questions, latest management accounts. Now we've bracketed 2020, but for some people they don't have the 2019 audited accounts, so that we could still take management accounts for 2019. We need your latest edging debtors list. Edging debtors list is your debtors, uh, probably for the last, 365 days, but you need to list them the last 30 days, the last 60 days, the last, you know, please age them accordingly. And then we need technical references of works performed in the last five years, yeah? So if, you, if you're in construction, it is assumed that you have some form of experience. So please share that experience. We require a bill of quantities. I mean, you should have already, you know, you, you should already have your cost of the construction prepared and ready for it because that's that's what has helped you determine how much you need for funding. Profiles and professional certification of project managers, surveyors and engineers, professional indemnities of architects and engineers, a list of major assets and equipment owned by the company. Now, this is important. This is not even just related to the, to the, to the project because these assets enable us to understand the total value of your business vis-a-vis -vis what you're asking for. Uh, it, it's really important to also establish in terms of security. You know, the if you're able to list everything, it, it's advantageous for you because it, it gives you it gives security. An environmental assessment certificate and any other statutory licenses as per your countries. And if you're in construction, photos also help, you know. It's good to show what the work's already done or that specific project where you're at. I will go to ICT sector where we have the basic KYCs, which is the basic, as I had mentioned in construction, and then the tax clearance certificate, company profile, details of any current litigation in which the company is involved in, um, audited accounts, management accounts, debtors list, Qualification and experience of personnel. This is service sector and your qualification and experiences are key. And any other statutory licenses. I'm guessing a permit is valid for everyone. Everyone needs to have a permit, you know, just a permit to, to trade or a trading license, whatever you would like to call it, pretty much same. There's the trading sector where we have the basic and then we have tax clearance, 
and depending on where you're at and whatever your business is about so it doesn't mean you must have this it depends it just depends only if your business so we have economic diversification drive certificate where applicable export licenses if you're in import export business company profile any current litigations and the rest are the same aging debtors qualification of personnel and other statutory licenses health sector again depending on whether you are practicing or you're selling equipment in health sector whatever it is um, the basics are the same. However, we have extras like import export license if you're buying equipment and selling it. We have um, qualification licenses and experience of key personnel. So if you're a doctor and your pastor and the board is comprises of medics, we require licenses and medical board licenses and also their licenses to practice and any other statutory licenses. In the services sector, we have the same thing. Uh, we have actually the same thing, the same documents. Nothing unique there. Hospitality, well, hospitality has a lot of unique because we require some extras like food handlers, health certificates, environmental certificates, occupation certificates. So just attach everything to the checklist as per the checklist, yeah? And then if you're in agriculture, we have certificate, oh, different types of certificates, animal transit permit certificates, horticultural permits, livestock permits. So you understand your business and what you're venturing into. So please share the relevance. Now, if you don't have, just state where you're at and if you're able to plan to get them by August or because you need to have your stake in the project it is important to have your stake in the project not a hundred percent yeah uh we have manufacturing all relevant licenses inclusive of environmental impact ensure all the licenses are available financial services governing bodies are key when it comes to that so ensure you have licenses we have the mining sector again governmental bodies are key ensure you have licenses for that over and above the basic now there is a checklist that you will attach you tick what you have yeah so you will tick and then you give reasons why or why not you don't have or the status of acquiring the certificates so as you can see we have application letter which is the same as your executive summary again i was uh, uh, as mentioned some of the summaries were a bit conservative so just polish them and ensure that they are more clear on what is you know what you need and how much you need and how you want to spend it and then we have a well documented project proposal or a feasibility study now that one is a couple of pages where you give us you know from beginning to end of your project and how you will you know where the money uh, how the funds will be incorporated how you're spending them i mean just give a feasibility study to the end to the payback of the same because we understand this is either an equity fund or debt fund that you're getting or revenue share um now here is just you just tick i've said all those things in the previous requirement list so you're just taking through to see what you don't have what you don't have or what you have but it is prudent that you try and attain the maximum number of documents that you can please try and attain the maximum number of documents that you can and whatever you don't have like for example number 14 is proof of legally registered address proof of operational address now some of us are working from home your resident is also your office so you have have either an utility bill in your name or something, something that just shows that that's where you're working from. It could be a lease agreement, because if it's your home, I'm guessing you have a lease agreement with your landlord. If, if, the, if you have rented an office, again, you either have a lease agreement or a utility bill. So just something that shows that that's where your business is. We have number 15, ID documents of member of the board of directors and senior management. Sometimes the shareholders are not really running the company. They have to acquire experienced personnel to run the company. So it's prudent to share who that experienced board is. 
and also the proof of address uh, uh, of the board members. Open above that, everything else has been in the industry requirements. So you just tick as you attach. It'll help you and guide you to make sure you don't leave anything behind. So I must stop sharing the screen there as I go through what we what happened after the preliminary. Now, during the preliminary, as mentioned, we just went through the page, the executive summary, and we categorized into three. Now, what we did is we color coded them. We gave them colors based on the seniority of categories. So the highest category ones that we thought was strong proposals based on presentation were given a green color. So if you see yours is in green color, then it was a strong proposal. It doesn't mean it doesn't need work, but it means that at least you are able to articulately explain what you want, how much, you know, everything was very clear, the purpose, how you beat competition, everything was clear. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that the others weren't good ideas. Actually, everyone had a great idea, great ideas. Some of them who are in the yellow had amazing ideas. They even should be in the green section, but it was just, you could tell there was reservation when writing it you know you can tell there was some reservation that you you're not you're not sure on whether or what to say and how far how deep should i explain myself just say it all say it all it doesn't matter uh, do, do not feel like you have exposed yourself in any way if you if someone is giving you the money do not even feel ashamed or anything about it. just be very clear and transparent about it so if you find yourself in green you are clear but you can now back it up with your supporting documents. If you find yourself in the middle category where you are clear, but something wasn't clear, you know? Half, it was partially okay, the idea was okay, but something was missing, yeah? And I will give an example. Um, someone indicated that they are seeking uh, to establish a farm and a processing factory. Okay, fair enough, it's clear. Whatever the amount they want was clear. However, the company's scale of operation is not clarified. We don't know how long the company has been in, uh, incorporated. What is the vision? You know, it was not clear. So the idea was great, but the, the, we require a little more clarity. So we put them under monitoring. You could find that somewhere else, someone else was seeking funds to establish a daycare. Now, th th that's fair enough but they have not stated when they were established, if they have been established, um, their approval to operate as an educational facility. You know, th th there's a lot of um, gaps that, we, that are yet to be understood. And we have given that in our feedback so that next, when you're giving for your second approval, you're able to fill in the gaps, uh, which will prepare you for August. Um, uh, we had someone else in agro, proce pro agro processing. Now, the purpose was to raise capital for a press and refinery vegetable cooking oil plant. And they would give out the amount. They already showed the competition and how there was little competition. They were clear that there is demand. They showed us who the market were. The market looks like it was ready according to them. And we're like, wow, okay, tell us more. Give us you know, more information. Give us your supporting documents. Let's see where you're at. We have someone else who uh, wanted to purchase an additional. Now, this is amazing. If you're purchasing additional equipment, it's good for you to show how what you already have, the equipment that you have and how much you have been producing and then your revenues with the current equipment. So should you add the new equipment, your revenues will be X, Y, Z. So that one was very clear about it and we want to know more. We, now, you should attach if you have eight performer invoices of the equipment you're purchasing, that helps understand because we have asked that you break down usage of the fans. So you have invoices are supporting documents that I have invoices, the equipment is worth XXX. So we already know this, um, this chunk of the funds will go into the equipment and this chunk will go to commissioning, this chunk will go into hiring staff, this chunk will go into training of uh, the staff so that you can expand accordingly so that was great um we have a few others where um 
in the yellow, and in the yellow, the responses were the company has not yet begun operations and they are not clear on the income generating model. Now, if you have not yet begun, uh, begun operations, then you have the scrutiny is actually a little bit more because we need to understand that this model, we, the model needs to be so clear. Yeah? And whatever R&D, research and development you've done in that sector to show that that concluded to you knowing that you need X amount to do this and the market is ready for you. Um, I think that's a little bit about some of the um, executive summaries that we reviewed. So um, after this, you will receive the feedback through your team leaders, of course. Uh, I will allow Nyakan to come back to you so that you can have room for questions. Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Michelle. And thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Roland, as well, and the rest of you. Um, any questions for the process uh, that uh, Michelle has just highlighted? Any, any questions, any thoughts, any comments? And uh, Stella, you could also give some insights, um, you know, working very closely with our enterprises in Botswana, you know, and, and also having a clear understanding of the context um, of Botswana across the sectors and some of the preparation that could be needed. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nyakan. Um, yes, we will proceed with the preparation for the second uh, submission that is coming in July. As Michelle said to my team, you will be getting all these documents that she has just shared with us uh, immediately. I will forward them into your emails. And then I know that amongst you, because of time, some of you have not managed to do their submissions or presentation, and some just ran out of um, network and fell off the system. And they've been asking me on, on the platform in terms of what happens. And the answer I've just given, which Ms. Shell, you can comment on, is that the process continues. Uh, I will be giving them the, the updates and the feedbacks and we'll work with them on the projects in terms of the preparation for the second submission. Uh, we should have a meeting next week to go through this while our minds are still fresh and to beef up what, has, what was just discussed today. So from my side, I'm happy, I'm thankful for your presentation, Michelle, especially in the, the checklist and the requirements per industry. Obviously, it's not, even if we are within the industry, it doesn't mean that your project qualifies for every other list. As she said, you pick up those that are relevant to your presentation and submit them. So I'll truly encourage everyone else to go deeper into details of what is needed in the second presentation. Yes, we have identified the lack of transparency and some a lot of conservativeness in the presentations that were given. I think now at this stage, everybody is comfortable that you can open up yourself to the investor. Obviously, when somebody is putting money in your project, that is the person to be very transparent, honest, and open to. So thank you. From my side, that is what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Sorry, thank you, Nyakan. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> I'm so used to working with Molly. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. She's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of us. Yeah. Thank um, you. For your insights as well. Yeah. Uh, you'll definitely be seeing a lot of me from now onwards, a lot of <laughs> communication from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Rowland. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you, Stella. Um, anyone from Botswana, any project owner that would like to say anything else before I begin sort of to highlight what our next steps are? Anybody want to say anything? Yes, please. I'd like to say something. I just wanted to find out from the checklist. 
I've, I was looking at my project and I was wondering where they, they fall onto. You know, I've got the events and the TV talk show production. So where would they fall in that checklist? Michelle? You're in the services, you're in the services industry. Services. Services so, for both. Now, you, because you have TV, you have extra licenses that you need to acquire. So you need to attach that if you have already attained them. Okay, yeah. so um, what if you, it's a startup, it's a new thing. Do you then need to give timelines when you think you'd have all those licenses in place? Yes, yes, just give timelines. You can give timelines. Okay, thank you. This is to say that should at the, at the time of the second submission, should you not have received a license for the talk show, for example? you indicate that you, you still are in the process of acquiring it. I hope it's clear. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, okay. it is. Thank you, Wagomotsa. Um, anybody else? Anybody else with any last question or need any clarification? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, yeah, it's Edda. Edda. Although I did not do my representation, com I'm not from Botswana, but I'm in South Africa. I'm yet to submit my executive summary. That's okay. So I've got That's... a question for yes. Michelle. Mm -hmm. When I'm doing my first submission of summary, do I have to include what you have already mentioned here? Or oh, it's for the second presentation? Um, your executive summary should be yes. as I have given an, uh, frequently in the FAQs I mentioned, we have the basics. You see, supporting okay. documents you can't give in the first okay. for the preliminary. But for the okay. preliminary, we require an executive summary in the format that you have been shared with that okay. captures all the things mentioned, which is the amount, the purpose, the objective, competition, marketing and distribution channels, usage of funds, your current revenues, your projected revenues and cash flows. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a one page, you're able to capture all of that in summary. In the first summary, I have to capture everything, competitive, competitors and the usage of the funds. Yeah, no, it's like, not. It, no. Hello? Hello? No, you're not able to capture in depth. You're just okay. able to say a brief. I have five competitors in the industry, so we already know you are competing with five people. However, I'm able to do this different. That's it, you know? Okay. Just, no. just a small no, it's fine. Thing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, All right. thank you. Anybody else? Hello. Before I yeah, okay. Can I, can I ask a quick one? Hello. Yes, Tris Hello. Lucy. Hello. Go ahead, Lucy. Can you hear? Go ahead, Lucy. Yes. Uh, I also have a question for Michelle. I didn't quite follow. Maybe my system is not very clear. Where do I fall? Because my project is to provide service. Where I, I I didn't quite follow the my pro my my my, my project is, is uh, production and provision of services to the people. Where where do I fall in that list? I I didn't quite follow. Sorry. Okay, now that list is not conclusive because every project is unique. You could be offering services, but your services require extra licenses, like a lawyer service industry. But you need licenses related to practicing, you know? So it depends on which side of the services, the extra, but that's why I, at that list, checklist, we have written statutory legally required licenses as per your industry, whatever the project is about. So it could be services industry, but you require extra licenses. Hello, can I speak? Yes, please, yes. go on. Hello. Yes, uh, I just wanted to to find out uh, the uh, let's say the, the, the your turnaround per annum. 
Um, is, there an, is there a number that the investor would be looking at? Dr. Roland? Yeah, there, to talk, talk to there is not a specific number that investors are more comfortable with than another number. The real key is uh, how does that number that you're requesting relate to the current business? If it's a startup and you're mm -hmm. wanting, you know, two million dollars, but yet there's another company that's doing uh, five hundred thousand dollars in sales and they're asking for a hundred thousand dollars for a piece of equipment, it's a much smarter, wiser, safer investment for the investor to invest a hundred thousand dollars into the business that's already doing five hundred thousand. Now, if you had a startup mm -hmm. and uh, and you could and you needed a piece of equipment or you know something strategic that to, if they invested thirty thousand dollars in your business, you would make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars over the next twelve months. That's a great investment as well. So uh, it can even be the same investment size, uh, but depending on the business. Uh, one can be safer than the other. The key as a business owner is to give investors as many reasons as possible to be comfortable to invest in your business. And so that's mm -hmm. making sure you have your assets uh, listed and in order, have good clean records and accounting and bookkeeping uh, of your sales or transactions, have things very well thought out. And if someone is going to, as Michelle mentioned, you know, invest in your business and give you say $100,000, uh, it's not enough to say I'm going to invest in equipment and machinery and marketing uh, because I've seen people try to invest. Uh, one person wanted $2 million in funding for marketing and business development. And what their plan was is to buy a Snapchat, an ad on Snapchat, which is like a social media platform. Well, a, a 30, one 30 second ad costs $2 million. So if somebody had actually invested in that, their money would be gone in 30 seconds. Now, what happens if nobody clicks on that ad? What happens if nobody buys? I promise you, they're not going to get five or $10 million in sales from that $2 million. Okay, so even when you list out how the funds will be used, uh, we will be able to look at that instantly and know, do I think that you will be able to generate enough revenue or enough customers to make that investment worthwhile? And that's the ultimate question you have to ask when you're asking for funding, uh, Will that amount of funding cause your business, your revenue to grow? Not just because you think it will, not just because it should, but by the numbers with math, uh, because you know how much it costs to get a customer, you be able to calculate that. And may I support Mr. Uh, Dr. Roland, sorry? Um, he said that you need to support it with math. Now, we asked for a cash flow, projections of your cash flows for the next 24 months, but that's not limited. Some of you, depending on the industry, it could be a five-year projection. If you're in a long-term uh, construction that will take a commission of about 12 months or 24 months, so it, it depends, but 24 months is the minimum. So in your cash flow projections, ensure that you capture this all your income streams all of them the first at the top of the cash flow is your income streams so we're all using an excel to calculate all our income streams then after that if you expect we you can take either the month of october or november whatever month you think, or whatever month you think that you will re, uh, you will need the fund requested. So if you're requesting for $2,000, and okay, $2,000, and you think that when you inject $2,000 to your business in December of 2020, that's when it will increase what you're working on, please put it in your income. So let your income increase by the amount that you're asking for. Now, after that, we will have an expenses section, the middle section. Put down all your expenses. Let's see how you break down the amount you have requested for over the next period of months or years. So some of you might use it immediately. You'll pay for equipment and it's, it's gone. And then now you just have to show how your income will increase from there after the, the equipment is now bringing in revenue. For some of you, you need to use that money over a period of time because you will be purchasing you know, you will be paying or purchasing for whatever it is over a period of time. So let us see that and your expenses maybe for the next 
um, 10 months, we can see how your money has been spread for 10 months or whatever long period you need. Now, let us see how it is uh, uh, used. And then after that, because some of you might receive a debt uh, fund, so you need to be repaying it. So you can show how you'll be able to, how your margins after that, because it's income, expenses, and of course, revenue minus expenses is profit or loss. So that profit or loss, you can show how it will pay the debt. Yeah. So that, that, that way you're projecting how you will pay it should you receive it as a debt fund. If that just to clarify on what he had said. However, I would like my colleague Buhere, she's on the call, to speak something else, a little bit about that. Uh, just before she comes in, one last question to Dr. Rowland is uh, a question that I received yesterday. I'm glad that I didn't miss it. The question is, uh, what type of financial instruments are available from the funding, from the investors that are coming? We keep talking investment funding, equity funding, but we don't mention a lot of loan funding. So the question was, what type of financial instruments do we have that the investors are bringing as opportunities for us? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, the three main areas are debt financing, uh, which is a loan, uh, equity uh, investing, or uh, revenue sharing. So on the debt instruments, uh, most of those are going to be longer term. Uh, maybe, and I mean longer term, like 24 plus months. Um, and that's, uh, now real estate is a little bit different, obviously, that's a different type of a loan. Uh, but but loan, uh, there's equipment loans, there are different types of loans, uh, which is why when they list out what the funds are gonna be used for, if it's mainly equipment and machinery, that provides the investor, uh, he knows exactly what they're going to use, what instrument they will use to in, uh, invest. And that also helps drive the interest rate. Uh, th some of the rates are, well, first of all, they're all lower than some of the rates I've heard, uh, you know, when people were talking about 20% as a baseline, but uh, it's much, it's lower than that. Uh, but, um, but those are the different types of, of, of debt financing. Uh, they do not specialize in, you know, 60 to 90 day loans, uh, which are considered, or really 30 to 90 days, which are considered bridge loans. Um, uh, they don't really do much of that. Uh, we can, we can, provide that or bring that in. Uh, but most of the deals that I've heard do not need bridge loans. Uh, that's really if I had a, let's say I had a million dollar order that they were, they were going to pay in 30 days, but I had to pay for the goods and services now in order to deliver on that. Um, then I would need bridge financing in order to pay for the product, uh, in order to build them in order to make my profit and wait for my money to come in. Uh, so that's bridge financing, but primarily, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, it, it would. It would be a, a traditional loan. Uh, there are such things called convertible notes, um, uh, where where it may start off as a loan, and if if the business does not pay that loan back, or if it starts to default on paying that loan back, then it can convert to equity, uh, and that is a popular uh, structure for debt because it provides a, a, a sense of collateral for that loan. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. And I know it is McDonald's, uh, his hand has been up as well. Yeah, Dr. Roland, just before McDonald goes, goes on, could you speak again? Because I know we keep having uh, these same questions tied together. You know, what kind of financing and interest rates? Um, maybe you could just tie up on that interest rates as, uh, as McDonald comes in. Certainly, yeah. So the interest rates, uh, you know, usually it's uh, five to seven points higher than what a baseline prime would be. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, many business loans are between, you know, seven and 12%. Uh, the, the, the riskier they are, the higher the interest rate is. Um, I haven't uh, seen one that went really over 14%. Uh, and that was for, for very risky. Um, and so, you know, it depends on also the sector that you're in and what assets you have, underlying assets. If it's a, if your business is doing a million dollars a year, 
and you're asking for a $50,000 loan, that's not near as much risk as someone who's doing zero revenue and wants a million dollar loan, you know? Uh, so th there's a lot of risk, a lot of risk with a company doing zero revenue to asking for a million dollars versus a, you know, an established company. And then real estate loans have the lowest interest rate of all types of lending. So if, if you are buying property, uh, then, then that is a, an advantageous uh, perspective. Many of you have talked about building factories or building plants, and you ought to consider if there are any existing structures that you can buy and simply convert to a plant or factory, that is much smarter than you trying to get financing to construct uh, the right kind of plant because there are so many intricacies that you cannot possibly know uh, prior to, to starting your business on the best way to build a plant. You just, you just don't know uh, what your exact flow should be. There's a lot of templates, there's a lot of plans, there's what you think it should be, and then there is what will actually be and the way it will actually work. And there's always a difference uh, in the entrepreneur world. So hopefully, and then of course, equipment financing is just above uh, real estate in terms of the interest rates and then below, uh, below what, a, what a convertible note uh, loan might be. Thank you. So maybe one last comment from uh, McDonald, and then uh, we can we can wrap up. McDonald. Let me take him off mute. Uh, hello. My question is yes. uh, directed to Michelle. Um, in terms of, of licensing, like, like for my uh, project, uh, the licensing uh, only comes into play when the, the factory is set up and it's up and running. Uh, that's when the licensing can come up. But as for the other registration, like the company registration, that is all in order. But the actual licensing to get a license for operations, it only happens when when the factory is now set up. So how do you treat that one? Fantastic. That means you're constructing something, right? Yes, you're setting up a factory. Yes, you're setting up Fantastic. a factory, yes. You're setting yes. up a factory. Do you have any yes. license to construct? Sorry? Do you have license for construction? Not for the uh, not for the operationalization. Food, it's a food food processing plant. So 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 the Ministry of Trade will only issue the license for manufacturing at a point when the plant is 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 now is now ready to be used. Um, let me ask you a question. Do you have the have you acquired the property where the plant will be uh, raised? Do you have land? No, 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 no land. It's a startup. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, Dr. Roland, please advise us on that one. Uh, yeah, there's nothing. Uh, he won't be able to provide any permits. I mean, it's truly just a plan. Um, and I think that uh, his project in particular may require government participation, government subsidies, uh, as opposed to outside investment dollars because of the nature of it. And certainly because of where it's at in the pipeline, uh, we need to keep uh, developing uh, the proposal, uh, going through the process, so that um, whether it is a central bank uh, or, uh, you know, a, a, a funding partner of the United Nations that we have, you know, if, if we can present uh, the packaged bundle at a, at a future. You know. Yeah, let me comment on that one. For, for, for McDonald's project, during the construction process, you will have to have the relevant documentation to put up the plant to the end. 
and then it is upon completion of the plant with the equipment inside that the trade licensing for that specific food processing will be issued upon inspection. So at the time of submission, these are the things that he will indicate and he can get the relevant documentation from both the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Trade. So it should not be a problem. Thank you, Stella. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rolle. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. But what you need to indicate, um, uh, McDonald, is probably do a bit of research on the kind of licenses and permits you will need to deliver that project, and then indicate also some timelines that you may, you may, you may need it on the document. So you don't have the documents right now, but you do the research on the kind of you know, certification and permits that you need and also indicate the kind of timelines that, that, that it would take you to get those. Because I think that will make it efficient when you engage with the, with the investors and the teams, you know, during, during any time they make the offers. Yeah, yeah. Noted. So thank you, thank everybody. You. Um, I would love um, to wrap this up by just sort of like highlighting the next steps that we will be having. Yeah, moving out of this call, you've seen um, what the process entails. You've been able to engage, yeah. Um, on, on, on your projects, you know, with, uh, with the feedback from the technical team and Dr. Roland representing the investors and representing investors' mindset, um, also with Steve. Um, Dr. Roland, I still have a question from somebody saying uh, that maybe you need to respond to, to, you know, investors and startups. Do you want to do that before I wrap up? Uh, sure. What's the question? Um, how will in treating startups? Because I know there are some startups, could be startups, but they're already making money, investable. But so what kind of is an, yes. and what kind of startup is? Yes, I, I would say in short that uh, if you have a, a, a startup, traditionally, it, we define it between pre-revenue and post-revenue. So if you are generating revenue, even if you are new, even if you started generating, even if you start generating revenue next month before we get there in August, okay? That's why I'm trying to help you take baby steps to just start. Some people, uh, you know, they've, we've spent a lot of time on the planning process, forcing you to think through things that you might not have thought of on your own. But at some point, you have to just start. And you start with where you are, not where you wish you were, not where you, you know, would like to be. You start where you are with what you have. And if you can't figure out how to start where you are with what you have, Money's not going to fix that problem because the skill is being creative. The skill is overcoming obstacles. That's the definition of an entrepreneur. I, all I do is overcome obstacles for a living. <laughs> and, and so uh, the, you, getting creative uh, over and over is the skill, and that's what makes you investment worthy. So start with where you are with what you have, and that, that says a lot. It goes a long way. Uh, be very realistic with what you need. Investors do not want to underfund you. They want to give you enough money to be successful, but they also don't want to overfund you. And, um, and they want to see that you know how to handle that kind of money. I mean, if somebody has never had a million dollars in their life, why in the world would you give them a million dollars to build a factory? They can't build a house, much less a factory. They don't know how to do that. So that would be a waste of money. So you have to uh, grow. Uh, with some of these things and refine your idea, refine your plan. Uh, so, and that's why I say on the startup, if it's pre-revenue and your idea, uh, you know, is to build a whole new city <laughs> and the infrastructure, and it's a great vision, it's a great dream, it's just not a good starting point, okay? And so that's the difference between uh, it, those kind of startups uh, do not have much success with funding. And then the other startups where they've started, maybe very, very small, maybe they only have 10 customers, uh, but at least they have somebody who likes what they do and is willing to pay the price point that you are asking for it. Uh, that shows uh, market uh, acceptance and uh, proof of concept, which is what they really like. So hopefully that delineates two types of startups. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that is clear. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, you've seen all the engagement, all the conversations, all the guidelines, the checklists that have been given, the insights and the ideas that have been shared on the call. 
please take note, irrespective of where your project is, irrespective of your, of your sector, take all the ideas that came on the call and, and use those to enrich your submission. So in terms of next steps, um, emails will be sent to all of you, each project owner, clarifying, highlighting the next steps that we have agreed that you know you take back your executive summary, you, 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 know, you enrich it, you strengthen it based on the feedback that you have got on this call, based on the insights and the recommendations you've received. You will also have an attachment uh, with the checklists that Michelle has shared so that you can take that into mind and start to attach the documentation that's required. And uh, you'll also have the frequently asked questions with you, just in case you know, you're thinking about it as you go, you forget what we were discussing, you'll be able to refer back to that. So, so that's, uh, you know, first thing, uh, you know, uh, point one as a next step out of this. The second thing is um, your lead um, uh, for your country, in this case, Stella, uh, will receive the pre preliminary analysis re report outcome from our technical teams. And um, she will be able to share with you the findings, uh, you know, the color coding that Michelle shared, you know, there was a yellow, there was a blue, there was a green, and with notes of what you need to do to strengthen your proposals. So that you will receive from your country lead and you'll have that guidance. And you know, our technical teams are available on the back end to support. And then uh, the submission date uh, for the strengthened proposals is the 10th of July. Uh, take note of that date. You need to su resubmit before or on that date. Once you have resubmitted on the 10th of July, um, what we're going to do now after that is we will send you information uh, uh, on how to register now for the physical tour that's happening in August. And we'll also send you information that has the, the physical locations of where the tours are going to be, okay? So those are your next steps and all these will come to you uh, via email. I hope that's clear and I just want to thank um, you all for being on this call. I really want to thank um, Steve Lugalia for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us um, on this, you know, on this uh, round of, of review, virtual review with Botswana. Really, really thank you so much. And maybe you can give your last, you know, last words you know as we as we close out uh, the meeting um a very very big thank you to you michelle and the technical team that are working behind the scene represented by yourself on this call great work very well done for what you're doing with the, the six countries you know um i know steve is also involved partly with that very well done and thank you you can have like some last words as we wind up the call and Dr. Roland, thank you so very much for the, you know, the great insights, you know, all the ideas and the light bulbs that you've been sharing as we together strengthen um, these, these projects and these enterprises to make it to the end. You know, um, we're really, really grateful. So as we, we close off the call, just um, last words, um, Steve, uh, Michelle, uh, Molly, thank you so much. You know, all the country teams know your name more than ours, <laughs> even though you're silent on this call. Um, thank you so much. Um, for, for the work that you're doing with the country teams and the support that you give them on a day-to-day. -day. Yeah, so, so last words over to you, Steve, and then Michelle, and then Dr. Roland, and then we can close off the call. Thank you, uh, Nyaka. So, my last words. Um, as a potential investor, what am I looking at? I'm looking at basically three things, yeah. I'm looking at viability of your project. So as you do your final submissions, think about viability of your project, which talks a lot of things, including the market. Yeah. The market, including efficiencies of your processes. Yeah. I'm looking at my return on investment at the end of the day. So you need to show me numbers that will convince me that if I put in money, I'm gonna get a decent return. And more importantly, especially when people are looking for money, they tend to get very ambitious. Entrepreneurs are by nature very ambitious people. They always present things in a very colorful way. But I always say you need to be realistically optimistic. I want somebody who is sold on his idea, somebody who's convinced about it, somebody who's passionate about his idea. I love that. But I also like to see somebody who is also very realistic. Say, this thing I think can work very well. Yeah? But these are my limitations. And based on these limitations, I think I can be able to deliver A or B. Yeah? So don't give me numbers that, you know, when I start questioning those numbers and engaging you, I realize actually you, you're building castles in the air because you're so taken away by your idea that you forget being realistic. Yeah? So viability of projects, important. Return on my investment, critical. And being realistically optimistic. Again, I don't want an idea that, you know, 
it's lukewarm. I want something that is warm and hot, something that is hot, but some that can be delivered. Be sure that you can deliver what you promise. So when you look at those numbers, the final, the final uh, proposals, the final details, these are the sort of things that investors are looking out for. So those are my, 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 my last uh, recommendations to you. And I really wish you luck. I mean, what I've, what I've had today is really amazing. I mean, I've had some mega ideas and people only put up, put up factories. That is wonderful, wonderful. And the issues of things like having a startup, you know, a, a chat, this is a chat, a show, there's something to do with, um, was it a, a TV chat show or something like that? So the ideas have been diverse. I love them. Issues of agriculture, farming. Yeah. So well done for your issue luck in the second round. Thank you, Steve. So that's that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate it. See you, Michelle, for your last words. Okay. Buhere, I would like her to close this on behalf of the technical team. Valerie? Yeah. Okay, good Hello. afternoon, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Yes. yes. Okay, my name is Valerie Buhere. I work with Michelle on the technical advisory team. So I've listened to very many incredible ideas and it's very nice to put the faces to these ideas. So I, I see a lot of experience, market knowledge, and uh, you also have a lot of government support. So now myself being uh, working on the technical team, I also need to look at the viability and uh, real, the realistic nature of the business. So uh, what I've noted is um, you're very generous with, uh, you're quite conservative with the information you're giving, but the projections are very, very high. So you start to wonder, like, um, what I know is for most startups, it's, it's really not normal or it's very uncommon to end the year. It's quite normal to end the year in the red. So I've seen a lot of profits which can excite investors, but you know, very open with your investors. You need to outline the risks associated with that business. You need to be. You need. You need to look at that business as yourself. Just as uh, uh, Steve Lugalia said, you need to be optimistically realistic. Yes. Uh, I, I also want to note that there's a there's an investor with an invoice discounting business. I don't know. Um, yes. So uh, for such an investor, the, the associated risks are very high. So what are your risk mitigation measures? Yes, are you going to check security? Are you going to check credit insurance? So you, you just need to be open with the investor because they're going to be working with you in this journey. And I, also, I would also like to note that there are some businesses which, which did not give revenue streams. So we need to know uh, this business of yours, is it, for, is it non-profit? Is it for profit? So there are some businesses that come out as not for profit organizations. And you know, you're, you're trying to talk to investors unless you are trying to reach out to impact investors, you need to be really clear about how you're going to be managing your day-to-day -day operating activities, how you're going to raise profit. And in the end, because this investor, are, they're investing to get a profit. So they need, to, they need to see that this business will actually get revenue. Yeah, all in all, I would like to thank you. And for the next phase, I would like to see a breakdown of all these projections. I would like to see uh, this revenue that is coming in. Where is it coming in from? These expenses that are going out to arrive at the operating income, where are they going out to? We would like to see all that because at the end of the day, we are analysts and we need to see that, and this is a business. So we need to see that this business is going to work out in the end. Thank you. Back to you, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Nakan. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Michelle, and thanks, Valerie, for coming on. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, you know, Botswana got the, the luxury of having three people from, <laughs> from the technical team come on today, you know? Um, yeah, just to get a sense of the people who are working in the back end, uh, you know, when they're available. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, Dr. Roland. It's just, last, um, it's been a joy and, and, and a delight, you know, Nikon, to just spend this time uh, with the good people of Botswana. And I can't wait to be in Gaparoni. I can't wait to just hug your neck and encourage you in your, in your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, and then also help those that have done the hard work of, of building uh, a business worthy of investment, getting funded. Uh, we're very excited to walk you through this process and then continue supporting even after the fact. And even those of you who maybe, maybe August comes and goes and you didn't, you don't get funding. We still are going to have, diff we have different programs that we'll be able to keep working with your business to get you ready for, for uh, investment uh, from, from wherever it comes from. Uh, it, it, that's not the end of the journey. It never is. You just keep moving along and we'll keep working with you. So uh, I just, I, I appreciate each one of you and, uh, and your hearts, your spirits, and thank you for just sharing with us today. No, thank you so much, Dr. Roland. Always a pleasure. So um, Botswana, um, it was a pleasure to be online with you this afternoon. I'm sure you've got a lot of value from being on this call. Our hope is that you take all the learning, all the insights and all the recommendations and strengthen your submissions for a wonderful and favorable outcome. So from us here, it's, it's, it's goodbye. Thank you so much.